Demons of Arasak, Choosing the Demon, Book 1 by Celeste King. A dark fantasy romance taking place in the demon world of Arasak. Chapter 1. Cora. Cora, save me. I'm throwing open the curtains to let some morning light in when Matt comes rushing into the room. Beth is chasing after him, her eyes bright with fury. Not fair! You give it back! He throws himself behind me and sticks his tongue out dodging her swipes as she tries to get around me. He's got that naughty grin on his face, the one that indicates he's gotten into trouble. What's not fair? It was mine anyway. It was the last one, and Laura gave it to me. I stoop to stop them from tearing each other's hair out. Now just hold on a minute. What's this about? He took the last blueberry muffin, she protests with a huff, stamping her foot indignantly. Laura said it was mine. I glance at Matt, who seems to be hiding something behind his back. With a wry smile, I open my hand in expectation. Give it. His smile drops into a gape. No way. I wasn't asking, I say, urging him to produce the pastry. You know you're supposed to share it with your sister. They both groan. But he took two last night. Not true, he retorts. Is so. It goes on like that until I silence them with a wave. Enough of this. Matty, give me the muffin. And Beth, that's enough hollering. We'll get it sorted. Matt finally hands me the pastry, mashed by his tight little grip. I issue a muted sigh. Now this won't do. They're both staring at the pastry with longing. I don't blame them. Blueberries are terribly hard to come by on Protheca, and especially here, around the work camps. Still, I have a bag on ice, and a secretive smile comes over me. Why don't we make some more? That instantly brightens their moods. You mean it? I nod. Why not? We've been working hard. I think we deserve a reward after all. And we'll make enough food for the whole camp. You both can help. They cheer and jump about the living room, their excitement devolving into a pillow fight that makes them tumble into a giggling fit. I'm glad they can still find joy in this place. I want to keep it alive as long as I can before they're forced to work like the rest of us. Laura, my one and only blood sister, stands in the doorway, drying her hands. She's watching the kids mutely, a strange look passing over her face. When I speak, she seems to startle back into reality. So I was thinking we could do something nice for everyone. Her grey eyes home in on me in surprise as I continue. What do you say? Let's cook a feast for tonight. A smile flickers, disappearing as quickly as it comes. That sounds lovely. The kids split their mushed muffin as we wander over to the open kitchens of the camp, Laura drifting behind us, looking to the sky. I look too, noticing a heavy weight over the southern horizon. It's a beautiful morning, but that storm threatens to overtake the endless blue sky. I wonder silently what it means for us, but I put it to the back of my mind. We've got work to do, and I'm not going to let a little rain get in the way of our fun. I roll up my sleeves and instruct the children to their tasks. Matty, get me the flour. Beth, you know where the sugar is, right? Affirmatives all around. Laura drifts to the meat racks and starts preparing her own dish. She's been unusually quiet this morning, and her silent acquiescence is a little off compared to her usual gumption. But the unwavering enthusiasm is my modus operandi. Otherwise, we're just slaves to the dark elves, and I refuse to live like that. I want to be an example for others. I want to show them that they may own our bodies, but our spirits are ours, alone. No one can take them away from us. Beth, get me the whisk, and I'll show you how to mix the batter properly. I want to learn too, comes Matt's complaint right on cue. Don't worry, I say with a laugh. I'll teach you next. He gives a satisfied harumph and goes back to starting a fire in the oven, struggling to get the flint and steel to connect just right over the kindling. I smile at his earnest attempt, my joy dampened by the fact that in a few short years, he'll be sent off to the mines to work until his hands go numb and his lungs go black with naphtherium residue. He's only a child, but our masters don't see us as anything more than sentient cattle. Like this, Beth asks, interrupting my morbid thoughts. I snap too, trying to focus on my instruction. Yes, exactly, we don't want to whip it too much or it'll get chewy in the oven. And right before we put them in, we have to add the... 
the sound of marching soldiers interrupts the peaceful morning. Dark elf soldiers, here. Laura goes a shade darker than snow, and she glances at me. Our look is a knowing one. Dark elves don't bother to come down here in droves unless something is going on, and I had hoped, perhaps, that we could have one nice day before their oppression closed in on us again. I step out from the kitchens. What's going on? I ask a neighbour. She's already trembling slightly, her ageing hands fussing. It's Gidresu. My heart drops, and I have the sudden urge to hide the children beneath their beds. What? Why is he here? She only shrugs, shaking her head almost involuntarily. I glance back to Laura again, who seems to want to disappear into the walls. My baby sister, though she's a grown woman now, is cowed and terrified by the sound of a single dark elf's name. My jaw tightens as I watch the procession, and resentment threatens to overflow. Haven't they done enough? There has to be a hundred of the bastards. They don't do this sort of thing for no reason. Usually, the infamous Gidresu Idramin will make an appearance during midsummer, check the accounts, impose his presence on us for a day or two, and then leave again, disappearing to wherever he crawled out of. He's too early, I think, troubling myself over his sudden arrival. He's a short one, for a dark elf, and has a mouth that's too big for his narrow face. I hate him more than the invisible chains around my wrists. Gidresu is the cause of all our grief. I dare the dark elf soldiers to look at me, staring them down as they pass. They are well trained, but some look at me with malicious intent. I'd rather they look at me than my siblings. I don't want their attention to stray to the children, or to Laura. And that's when I see the bastard merchant himself. Gidresu, I think. What a pleasure. His eyes lock instantly with mine, and no matter how I stare, he merely flashes a toothy grin. I did not call for a feast in my honour, though I am flattered. I say nothing, keeping my chin up defiantly. He could have me whipped or quartered if I speak out against him. Their rules are hard and fast, sparing no inch for humans. Instead, I put on a sharp smile of my own. We were not expecting you, Gidresu. Something hateful flashes in his eyes, but it cools instantly, and he looks me over more thoroughly than even his devoted foot soldiers. Interesting, is all he says before he snaps his fingers, and two soldiers approach. Bring her along, it seems we have much to discuss. I go stiff when they grab me by the arms and carry me away, but I refuse to look back into the children's frightened eyes. I don't dare, because if I show a hint of weakness, they will use it against me. I have to be strong for everyone. Chapter 2 Giroth. The organ pups yip and chitter as I shut the gate. On a whim, I extend my hand and pat their bright-eyed mother, her fur coarse beneath my touch as she presses into it. Now don't be like that, I say with a small smile. I'll be back soon. She doesn't look as if she believes me, letting out a long whine through the many rows of her razor-sharp teeth. Her black tongue quivers as she lets out a gnarled bark, Yes, yes. I scrub under her carapace chin. I promise. Still eyeing me, she settles in a corner of the birthing kennel, and her young ones pile on top of her, sufficiently distracting her from my absence. I stand at the gate a little longer before I hear a voice behind me, grizzled and deep. Giroth, the Trollvor guard beckons. He will see you now. It is a long moment before I obey stepping in line with the jackal-headed demon as we exit the kennels. He stands tall and proud, with a heavy pole arm strapped to his back. They're not exactly the friendliest, but neither am I. What is the reason I have been dragged from my duties, Trollvor? The summons failed to mention. The king wishes to see you. Yes, of course, I say sardonically, rubbing the base of my proud obsidian horns. I gathered that much by the summons. I had asked. You do not question it, he interrupts with a snarl, his upper lip curling to expose his long canines. The hounds have made you petulant. There are rules, and you will obey them. I roll my eyes but say nothing more. This Trollvor has no interest in light banter, obviously, so I scour the busy streets of Tilith instead, recognizing all that we pass. And still, 
It seems strange. I don't come out often, except to gather the necessary supplies for the organ. I prefer to keep my horns lowered and my eyes on the next task, but one does not spurn the Demon King. A massive Gylock crosses our path, his heavily muscled body straining against a great weight behind him. His head is down, and his horns are nearly touching the earth as sweat slicks his dense gray flesh. Even the Trollvor halts. Behind the Gylock is a procession for a matron, who seems rather too occupied with the other inhabitants of her drawn carriage. Finally, there's an opening, and we pass through the wretched procession towards the royal estate. Here, towering spires rise up around us, and I already miss my kennels. But at least the inhabitants are respectful, making way for us as their gazes alight upon the stern Trollvor leading me. They rarely leave the king's side. The silence between us is deafening. I'm eager to break it with some wry quip, but I don't think he'll appreciate it under the circumstances. I have to wonder what I've done to garner the king's attention. What need does he have for a humble kennel master? Life on this planet has been peaceful since we arrived. I hardly remember the transition, but when it was done, we were free from our oppressors. Now our island of Galmaleth floats somewhere over the continents of Protheca, concealed beneath a charged cloud of darkness that follows us everywhere, a protective shroud from the other races who might do us harm. Finally, we are at the doors to the king's estate, which opened to us. More Trollvor stand straighter as we pass, staring over our heads. I take in the high vaulted ceilings and the multifaceted glowing glass that shimmers like ruby water over the high walls and pillars. It is beautiful in its own right, though I prefer the dank and musty kennels and the hot breath of my hounds. I do not belong here. We enter into a great hall, and at the end sits King Asmodeus himself. My miserable disposition has no place in his presence. I can feel the chaotic energy around him, a powerful nimbus as if he's made from the same stuff that crackles around the island. The Trollvor dips his head and stands to one side, giving me the opportunity to look upon our king, uninterrupted. He is leaned to one side casually in his heavy throne, his face completely concealed by his hood while an impressive pair of twin horns curl up and back. He leans forward as if to better see me, his garb somewhere between a warrior's and a sorcerer's, with heavy plates over his shoulders and chest, while exposing the deep purple robes of a Sosgaroth beneath. His voice, when he finally speaks, is resounding and all-encompassing, charged with magic. You are Giroth? I can't help but bow deeply, my sour mood evaporating. Yes, my king. I have a task for you, Houndmaster. I want to correct him, but I wouldn't dare. I am honored. Hmm, he says as if considering, resting his concealed face in a palm. You know of Prothica, he continues, no indication he's waiting for an answer. And the races below. My Sosgaroth have been watching the ground continents for some time and we have decided to harvest some of the inhabitants for an experiment. I hold my breath, hanging on his next words. What does this have to do with me? I am not a sorcerer or a military leader, like the princes. I have no stake in whatever war he means to wage on Protheca. Surely this tentative peace that we have experienced will end if we make contact, though I dare not say so. Perhaps war is what he seeks. And who am I to correct him? Yours is a simple task. Below, he says, waving at the marbled floor. Under the rule of the Dark Elves is a race primed for harvest. He continues, holding a serious gaze. They are kept as laborers, though our study of them has indicated that they are fertile creatures compatible with many of the races on Protheca. I want a dozen of them, he insists. You breed your beasts and know the ways of animals. So, Houndmaster, I leave it to you to gather what you believe are viable specimens for my experiment. I will provide you with a small army to back your efforts, and whatever else you need. I blink, hardly able to believe that he would put this great responsibility on me. Thank you, my king, I say in reverence, bowing deeply. If I may, speak your mind, he says with a wave. I lick my pale lips. Why me? 
Surely there are plenty who could complete this task. I can't see it, but I swear a smile graces his shadowed face. I can hear it in his voice. I could not trust this to a general or one of my sons, because they would scorch the earth with chaotic energy, and war would most certainly follow. I have no interest in engaging the races of Protheca just yet, not while our armies are depleted. This task is of the utmost importance, and I believe you, Garoth, will take the proper steps to maintaining a level of indiscretion that is necessary to execute my commands without failure. Do you have any further questions before you leave here? My mouth has gone dry. I can only shake my head. Good, he concludes. Then meet the Sozgaroth in the war room, and they will prepare you for the journey. My guards will escort you there. Take care, Houndmaster. I am led away, still speechless as reality dawns on me. A chill grips my pallid flesh, and my stomach is in knots. The ground continent? I think whimsically, wondering with dread how the soil of Protheca will feel under my boots. Sounds unpleasant. Chapter 3. Cora. They throw me at the feet of Gidresu before turning to guard the tent entrance, that heavy canvas which separates us from the rest of the settlement. Gidresu doesn't have to say anything. It is understood that this is his domain, and I am at his every whim. Out there he had to pretend he wasn't undressing me with his eyes, coveting my body and will. That sort of thing is below even his merchant caste, at least publicly. But we all know what the Dark Elves do to people behind closed doors. The bastard looks down his nose at me, gloating. You certainly have a mouth on you, he says with a hateful, growing smile. I glare at him. I said nothing. You speak when you're spoken to, human. The silence is deafening, but it does not have the effect he craves. He wants me to be afraid of him. I cannot find it in me to fear a spineless weasel. I may not say it, but my stare speaks volumes. It seems to unnerve him before he whips around, so I can't see his expression any longer. He desperately wants to maintain control, and I am all that stands between him and total domination of this little settlement. I know what's coming next, but I remain rigid, defiant. Still, I'm on my knees. I've heard about you, he says with his back to me. Flattered, I think to myself, watching his narrow shoulders tense before he turns back around, a practised mask of neutrality dawning over him. I wonder who on Protheca buys this joke of an act. I'd laugh if he didn't have a hundred guards to pin me down waiting just outside. The more I bruise his ego, the more pain he'll inflict on me. He drags a chair out from the long table and sinks into it, crossing one knee over the other, and that gluttonous look is back. Word is, your positivity is infectious. It raises the hopes of the slaves here, even on the darkest days. I'm sure you understand why I can't have that. My jaw works in irritation. Come here, he says beckoning me with a finger. When I hesitate, he cocks his head to one side. I own your papers, human. I can surrender you to the dark market, or sell you to an irreputable pleasure house in Pyrthos if I so choose. Instead, all I demand is your obedience. So, I'll say it one last time. Come here. Grudgingly, I rise from my knees and go to him. Before I'm within reach, he snaps forward with lightning speed and drags me onto his lap. A shiver overcomes me, and he seems to think it's one of fear, because his hands slide up my bare arms as if to warm me, tracing the hem of my sleeves. Beautiful, he admits under his breath, his gaze never reaching my eyes. Too beautiful for a place like this. I flush and glance away. They're just threats, I assure myself. He's only trying to scare me. But even as I think this, I can't be certain. His gaze is famished. You would make a fine addition to my cage in the city. I dare to catch my ragged collar as he tries to draw it down. No. No? He asks in a mocking tone, his touch tracing over my clavicle and up the side of my neck. There's no magic in his touch, and I'm glad for it. I felt dark elf magic before, and the memory of it still wakes me from a dead sleep, covered in sweat. Gidresu drops his mouth to the cleft of my shoulder, his lips hovering so that I feel his hot breath wash over me. You don't tell me no. 
human. With that, his mouth descends on me, and I feel a slimy, cold pair of teeth clamp into my flesh. I jerk involuntarily, but wouldn't dream of trying to tear away. A satisfied rumble begins in his chest as he explores up with that wicked tongue of his. He teases my earlobe, forcing me to bend to his insistence. You use your authority to torment us. You don't know what the word means. I swallow hard, the act made uncomfortable by the way he's forced me to bend. I am happy to educate you, though. His gaze goes soft, even as he urges my hips to lock with his. I'm glad that we're both still dressed, or he might have tried to take me, and I don't think I could bear such an insult. But if you insist on being disobedient, I can always offer you up to the orcs of Pratheca. Do you know what they do to beautiful human women there? I barely manage to shake my head. I've heard tales, he murmurs for the effect of chilling my blood, that they'll skewer them alive and roast them over an open fire, still squirming on the spit. My heart finally drops, and I close my eyes. I don't want him to see the true fear that sparks in them. What do you want from me? No need to rush, he says, pushing my hair back as if to better see my face. I want to enjoy your surrender, and if you are a good little human, I can promise that you will live to see another day. He hesitates, though I know he means to say more. And then it comes. To serve my every whim. There it is. He wants me to be his slave. I can imagine how he'd chain me to his bed and keep me there until my limbs grew frail and I couldn't escape if I tried. I think about the family I've gained here in the work camps despite everything and mourn internally for their fates. For Matt and Beth and Laura, who will never know what happened to me today. Gidresu, you bastard, I think, pressing against his chest with a little more resistance. My home is here. Your home is where I tell you it is, he murmurs in my ear. I own you. I grimace as he tries to steal a kiss from me. I hate how his lips connect, and how his tongue pushes between my teeth with ferocious intent. He doesn't care that I fight him, and it seems to only excite him more. That low rumble is back, but this time it's above us. Gidresu is resistant to pulling away again, but when he does, he glances to the canvas ceiling. I follow his gaze, though there's nothing to see as another low rumble shakes the air. They didn't say a storm was coming, he murmurs, seeming annoyed that we are being interrupted by the weather. I try to gently lever off of him, but he grabs my wrist and yanks me flush against him. You're not going anywhere, he growls flashing those sharp canines of his. And if you think... Guards rush in, and he dons an indignant expression. All at once he releases me, so that I fall at his feet. What is the meaning of this? he demands, half rising from his seat. I had explicitly ordered you to give us privacy. I barely manage to rise to a sitting position, as two guards with wild eyes signal to the door. I'm sorry, sir, but there is something coming in from the South Sea then deal with it. It reeks of magic, but there's something wrong. You must come see. Gidresu throws me an irritated glance. We're not finished here, he says, then follows after his guards in a rush. I can hardly breathe a sigh of relief as a mighty crash of thunder shakes the air again, and I leap to my feet to see what all the fuss is about. Chapter 4 Giroth There are more demons assembled here in the courtyard of the king's residence than I have seen in a long time, my preference being to avoid others at all costs and spend my time amongst the hounds. If I am to go to Prathika, then I am well prepared. At least I hope that is the case. So, what are we up against? I ask the Sosgaroth, who has also been provided to me by Asmodeus. His gaze remains cast down at the pool of dark water, his long white hair dropping over his shoulders as some disappears beneath it. His silence tells me he has found what was needed, as if that would ever be in doubt. The Sazgaroth are skilled and adept sorcerers, and as this one scries for me, I know I can rest assured that he can help me in this endeavor. 
The area that we have chosen. It is the right place to collect the humans, he says, his voice a rasp. They gather together in a settlement and are largely unprotected. I place my hands on my hips and nod. Then this should be quick and easy, I reply, glad that if I have to undertake this journey, then at least I will be back soon enough. He dips a finger into the water and looks up at me, tipping his head to the side. Maybe, he says, his eyes still cloudy, but returning slowly to their natural yellow state. But there are dark elves, around a hundred of them, some of their finest fighters. I bear my pointed teeth at him as he looks up at me, the Sazgaroth noticeably smaller than us Volvath. They will still be no match for us, I growl, my previous hope of a quick mission diminishing. All I want is to get this over with and return to the kennels with my hounds. Now, now, do not get your horns in a twist, kennel boy. I'm merely pointing out the fact that while humans may be easy to harvest, there are others that will not be willing to give up them quite as easily as you may like. My claws dig into my palms as I ball my hands into fists. What is it that I need to know about them? I ask, reluctantly, aware that though I am charged with this mission, I am still of low rank and only here because of my skill with beasts. These ones are powerful, he rasps, but I would have to agree with you. Though there is a darkness that runs through their strong bodies and blackened souls, they are no match for us. They have magic, but we have chaos, and chaos always wins. The look on his face is dark and triumphant, and I can't help but get swept up in his enthusiasm. The dark elves on Tyleith are the lowest of the low, used as slaves. The chaos magic stifles their ability to cast spells, and without them they are weak. The collars they wear keep them chained to their masters, both in terms of the body and the mind, which has been wiped of all knowledge of their former lives. These are the dark elves that I have known, but it seems there are others that have forgotten their place also. Now I look forward to slaying them. It has been a long time since I had the chance to exercise such instincts. You have a contingent of fifty here, all ready to do battle for you, so that you may please the king and bring back the humans. Are you quite capable, Giroth? His words hit me somewhere that feels uncomfortable, because this is not what I am used to, and hardly what I was made for. There are many who are far more willing when it comes to the battlefield, though I can hold my own. But I have never sought the glory and honor that many of my kind have coveted. To me, this has always been a worthless and thankless task. I am eager to serve, but never had my sights set on such missions, preferring to see to my hounds. It is them that I was made for. They make more sense to me than any other demon, and I am the one able to breed them, tame them, control them. Perhaps you can take two organs, says the Sazgorath, as if reading my mind. They would help with the hunting down and rounding up of the humans. And for protection, of course. No, I reply, firmly. As much as I would like to bring them with me, they are the only companions I have. But they are expendable down there. Losing them is not something I am willing to risk. I would rather not come back than return without one of them. His head straightens, his wide horns taking up the space around him, though it does little to make our size difference more equal. He and his kind will always be more skilled than the likes of me, but I will always be bigger, stronger. Though he riles me now, there is unwritten agreement between the Volvoth and the sorcerers. They provide the magic, we provide the muscle. That is what will happen when we get down there. Very well. It is not as if you will be acting alone, he says, once again as if he has read my mind. Take a look around you and prepare to visit the world below. Let us hope that we all return and that the king is pleased with your efforts. His words send panic shooting through me. There are not many things that I am fearful of, but Asmodeus would be one of them. Disappointing him would be another. Whatever happens, I must return with those human females. It is not just our species that may depend on it, but also my life as well. Turning to the gathering of demons, I narrow my eyes and rake them over those that will help me achieve my goal. The king has indeed been generous with his provisions. 
There are sword-wielding Volvath, jackal-headed Trollvors, their teeth already on display as they prepare themselves for battle. And of course, a Gilak, bred for war and hungry for it by the look of this one. He roars as his horns spew fire and beats at his naturally armored chest. In the corner are the Sazgorath, their eyes closed in deep contemplation as they focus on and prepare the chaos. We will surely need them if, as this sorcerer says, the Dark Elves are able to use their magic against us. So, are you ready? he whispers, the magic in the air beginning to crackle, my skin tingling with the charge. I take one last look around me, hoping this will not be the last time I see this place. The others, even the Gilak, now become quiet, the eyes of my brethren glowering as they clutch their swords. The arms of the Sazgorath stretch out. Yes, it is time, I say. Let us begin. I wrap my hands around my sword in anticipation of the chaos spell that will send us down. Suddenly the air becomes thick, almost viscous, and in my mind's eyes I see the faces of my beloved animals. I will be back for you. The magic wraps around my flesh, wild and cold, twisting and twining as if trying to swallow me. There is nothing I can do now. We are on our way to the world below and I can only hope that I can get the job done so that I may return from it. I close my eyes as the blackness takes me. Chapter 5 Cora, it should be a relief when I am tossed from Gidresu's lap and discarded like the rubbish they believe us to be, but instead something else creeps in. I can hear the shouting from outside, and my chest tightens, sensing that something is not as it should be. Show me, Girescu yells as he strides across the tent and exits. I watch as he disappears, glad to see the back of him, a strange mix of fear and relief coursing through me. There are many elves that I would gladly sink a blade into if I could, and he would be at the top of that list, always. I inhale deeply, glad for this interruption even though I know something is wrong, and I hear his orders of, gather the men. He must see something that signals a threat. Dark elves are known for their strength, their brutality, and from the sounds of it, they are ready to put this to good use. Already I am on high alert. Living as we do, I am vigilant to the extreme, always on the lookout for potential danger. It can be tiring, but it is necessary if we are to survive this world, and everything about this situation is screaming danger. Adjusting my rumpled shirt, I make my way out of the tent, the smell of him still in my nostrils as I try to forget his filthy hands that groped at my skin and the way that he sneered at me. This has been a lucky escape. It does not bear thinking about what he would be doing to me now if his soldier had not burst in. Outside, the darkness that greets me is far from the bright sunny day I was enjoying before I entered the tent. Clouds in varying shades of grey hang above me, and in the distance I can make out the threat of a storm the likes of which I haven't seen before. But it's more than that. Oh fuck, I mutter. The dread that crawls out of my guts can't be explained, but it's there, along with magic so dark in the air I can hardly catch my breath. My stomach turns and my mind races, my only thoughts being that of my family and I take off at a sprint desperate to get to them. We've encountered storms before, and they have been bad enough, but I've never seen a sky like that, one so alive with the promise of death. There are not many options for us in a situation like this, but I need to get to them. We have survived so far, and I will make sure that we do again, whatever is coming our way. Chest heaving, heart racing, my mind a whir. I am getting closer when out of nowhere I am faced with creatures, all of them terrifying as they appear before and around me. What in the name of the gods? I shout, though no one can hear it over the screams and roars. They are huge, bigger even than orcs or dark elves, different in appearance, though each of them has a look of nothing but evil about them. Horns, long and curved, grow out of their heads, their bodies even more well built than the elves. They continue appearing until there is a small army of them. Their skin colour varies, some ebony, while others have a grey hue, and others are covered with fur. 
Red and yellow eyes glow, striking the terror of the gods into me. What are these things? A beast so large it crashes through buildings, destroying them as though they are nothing but sand, roars into the sky. Its body is covered with a thick, impenetrable layer of armour, its wings spanning the width of a building, and horns that blaze fire sit on top of its head. A few smaller of these creatures appear and scatter about the place, great balls of magic emanating from their palms. They quickly take cover behind their larger brethren, their main purpose seeming to be the magic that swirls around them as they strike out at the elves. Their horns are long and thin, and their ears are pointed, almost like the elves themselves, and their skin pale. The creatures leave a trail of destruction, cutting down the elves with swords that seem to be longer than the length of my body. There is nothing that can come close to the strength they display, though I thought I had seen it all when it came to elves and orcs. Magic fills the air, their magic, nothing like that of the elves, who now seem to be struggling to summon. This is different to anything I've witnessed them use before, a strength and a darkness so potent I can almost feel it touching every cell in my body. I bend over and throw up the meagre contents of my stomach, a heaviness clawing at me as these creatures run rampage across the settlement and beyond. Time itself seems to slow down, the oppressive nature of these beasts, and what they bring clinging to everything. Dark elves assemble, though the nature of this gathering and the way that they scream at each other shows just how little they were prepared for something like this. How could anyone be prepared for such an event, just when it seemed this world could not get any darker? Terror grips me, my route home blocked by the chaos, as I now find myself in the centre of a battlefield, one where elves and monsters fight to the bitter death. The screams of elves are something I would welcome in any other situation, but right now all they do is add to my desperation. Cries of pain, the thud of large bodies as they hit the ground, and the scattering of body parts as they fly through the air and land unceremoniously on the ground assault my senses. Whatever these things are, they are making easy work of the elves whose magic does not seem to be working at all. Taking cover amongst some crumbled ruins, I place my hands over my ears, desperate to feel some relief from this carnage. But I dare not close my eyes, as the horned creatures, at least eight feet tall, stalk across the settlement, their black horns reaching up to an even blacker sky. Above me it is now dark, the only light coming from the giant forks of it that split the sky, taking ownership of it as it cracks, whipping across the whole sky, reaching out from where I stand to the horizon. I'm at a loss to even begin to understand what this is, feeling as though I've fallen into the maw of the gods below. Is this the end for us all? After everything we have all been through, it would all come to this. Help! No! I'll do whatever you ask, just don't hurt me. The screaming is too much, and just the thought that my brother and sisters are adding to this din as they fear for their lives now leaves me glued to the spot. Where are they? Have they found shelter? I can't bear to think of how scared they must be. The air crackles with magic, making the hairs on my arms and back of my neck stand on end. This energy is so intense, it's a wonder anything can survive in its midst, and it makes that of the elves look like nothing but party trickery. The ground shakes beneath me, the footsteps of the giant beast claiming everything in their wake, and I have no idea what I'm going to do. So far, these monsters have their sights set firmly on destroying the elves. But what will happen then? I clasp my hands over my thudding chest, the worry taking me over. I must try to get to my family, but what if I'm already too late? Chapter 6 Kiroth. Darkness swirls above us, magic cracking the sky open, making me feel alive and alert. Around me the others appear, their faces indicating they are ready for the fight, eyes wild, teeth bared. The Trollvor howls, saliva dripping from a mouth that is hungry for blood. Dark elves are scattered like ants, scrambling to assemble as they see the threat that we present. But they have no idea what we are made of, something that becomes obvious as they try to hurl anything they can at us using their magic. Pathetic summons that are less than what a demon whelp can conjure. I was right. They are no real match for us. 
each look of shock and indignation as the chaos magic disrupts their pathetic attempts to slay us, ignite something in me that has long been forgotten as I delight in their undoing. I am a demon, after all, and made for such darkness. Life with the hounds has kept my blackest nature suppressed. Now it is being unleashed for the first time in what seems like a lifetime. I look on as their weapons are turned against them, their suffering etched on their faces as their bodies drop one by one to the hard ground, many not dead as they drown in their own blood, and the gagging sounds make my blood sing. I need more of it. Forwards, I cry, my voice deep and unyielding. I lead the charge, and cutting down elf after elf with my sword is proving easy, the heads rolling across the ground like harvesting the fruits of trees. They're strong. There's no doubt about that, and the look in their eyes is one that I recognize, dark and brutal. But there is also fear, the fear of wondering what they are dealing with and how they could fall so easily to us. The sword I wield is far too big for them to defend against, and I make easy work of their defenses as we advance. I slice bodies into a variety of shapes, marveling at how easily I can cut through tendon and bone leaving muscle exposed so that their death is painful. Chaos magic hangs in the air, rendering them next to useless when it comes to their own, and this is not something they are accustomed to, it would seem. No one can heal or defend. Not only are our bodies stronger than them, but our magic is too. Screams litter the air, and for the first time in a very long while I find myself feeling something other than misery. I even manage an amused smile as the Gilak rages, tossing the dark elves around as though they are scraps of meat being fed to the dogs. Leave none alive, I command, swinging wildly with my sword and taking the head off the approaching elf, severing it so cleanly that his head goes flying through the air and crashing with a wet smack. I can't afford to be distracted now. I have a job to do and the last thing I need is to displease Asmodeus. We need to act quickly and then be gone. So's Garoth, I call, demanding their magic attentions as I set out to complete the task I am charged with. Instantly, he is by my side, and I move on, knowing that with my sword and his chaos magic, I can get on with it with as little interruption as possible from these damned elves. Prowling around the settlement, I let the others see to the elves. My job is to round up the human females. I can smell their fear, even if their tiny screams are stifled by the chaos. The first that I find is so small, I can hardly believe we're going to attempt to use them for breeding purposes. She screams as I stalk towards her, and I smile as her fear feeds me. Mine, I say, dragging out the word to see how she reacts, before plucking her like a ripened fruit from the doorway in which she cowers. She fits underneath my arm perfectly, and as I walk off, another skitters past me as though she will not be needed now. I have her friend. I bare my teeth in a savage display of torment before catching her by her long, dark hair and wrapping an arm tightly around her waist once I have her. She beats at my arm, even sinking her teeth in, and I tighten my grip, threatening to squeeze the life out of her if she does not stop. Not that I will, of course. These women are being harvested to serve a purpose not just for blood sport, but I have little time for their nonsense. Nothing they do can stop this, whether they like it or not, and I am certain it is the latter. They are coming back with us. I'm not sure what their life has been like here on Prothica. From what we know, it was not something to be worried about losing. She stills under my arm as I hold her tightly, the only thing I feel now being the slight pressure against my arm as her futile endeavors to escape it begin to die down. The slaves! bellows a dark elf once he sees what I am doing. My slaves! I hiss, throwing the women to the Volvath, holding the shackles, before kicking the elf to the ground. He looks up at me, his eyes wide before I bring my foot down upon his head, hearing the shattering of bone instantly as his head gives way beneath my larger frame. The women scream, their sobs pressing at my anger as I continue my search. There are plenty to choose from, and like the hunter I am, I choose them all. Not one will escape my grasp today. If I am to be here, then I will ensure the job is done to the best of my ability. 
If this means I win favor with the king, then all the better. Carnage claims the landscape, the smell of blood, fear, and fire seeping up into my nostrils. My skin is alive with magic and my insides burn. How long has it been since I have felt like this? With the eyes and nose of a hunter, I track down my prey. I was chosen for this because of my way with beasts, and it seems as though Asmodeus was right. None will escape me. Not now. There are many of them, all so small, their faces and bodies so fragile and weak it turns my stomach. One by one I drag them from their hiding places, their arms and legs flailing in fearful protest, before handing them to one of my comrades, who shackles them ready to take back to Tileth. Still, dark elves fly at me. I had no idea they were so fond of their humans. They must indeed make good slaves, or surely they would not risk their lives defending their property in such a way. But I don't let this stop me and send them to the same place as their fellow soldiers. Before long the screams have died down, though the Gila continues its rampage roaring up into the blackened sky. The shackles are almost full, and I narrow my eyes gazing around, casting a final inquiring eye over the chaos before me. It has become still, surprisingly so, as I begin to assess whether it is time to take our leave. In the distance, the Sosgaroth hover in the air, waiting for my command to return us with their magic. Then, from the corner of my eye, I catch something. A flit of golden hair as another human woman, surely the last, takes off down the alleyway. But it's too late. I've seen her already, and have already made up my mind how unwilling I am to come back here, even if it has been a surprising break from the monotony of my life. Not one of them can be left. I've got this one in my sights. Chapter 7 Cora. I am as a hare in the midst of a great war, slipping between buildings and hiding until I can make my way home. That terrible sensation seeps into my bones and slows my progress. But I'm careful, and finally... I make it back to our corner of the settlement. What I see makes me skid to a stop. Our house is in ruins, the tattered curtains flapping wildly in the tempest that has overtaken the sky. Most of the roof has collapsed in on itself, but there is still a section that hasn't fallen yet. But my worst nightmare is upon us. What if they're already dead? Here, at least, the battle has moved on. The Dark Elves don't care to protect their valuable assets of human labourers. Gidresu will be their top priority, but even he will fall to these monsters that have rained down on us from the sky. He is a slaver, not a fighter. A terrible wind whips through the streets, bringing with it more of that darkness that oozes into everything it touches. I've never felt such evil magic as this, if it is magic at all. It feels nothing like the compelling power of dark elves that seeps into one's mind and makes us compliant to their will. They have to be here, I tell myself, throwing myself forward and pushing through the wreckage as I scream their names. Matty! Elizabeth! My throat closes before I can call for Laura. After all we've been through, it comes back to this. Always this. I remember pulling her small body from the destruction of our family home. I remember the screams of our mother as she told me to run, before a dark elf's blade silenced her forever and her words cut off in a bloody gurgle, and the awful chase before they pinned us down and threw us into cages. My mind is stretched between memory and the terror of this new reality, both intertwined in this one horrible moment. This is how it will always be, I realise, tearing at the broken wooden panels, searching for the little bodies of Beth and Matt, terrified of finding them, yet refusing to stop until I do. I don't see any signs of them, no blood or limbs beneath the drifting dust of the wreckage. My fingers are raw and my voice is hoarse, but I can't afford to stop. I push through the wreckage into the tediously erect bedroom we all share, but there's no sign of them at all. Laura, I croak, my throat parched by the dust. Where did you go? She should have been here, protecting them. The sound of battle drifts closer on a northern wind. I don't have much time before they're upon us again, and that monstrous creature tears our house apart with me inside. My family needs me wherever they are, and I refuse to give up. One of my nails breaks, shooting pain up my arm, but I hardly feel it, 
shaking it out as I keep moving. I find myself in the living room again, digging madly into the rubble. Broken glass and splintered wood are everywhere, as if the army had dropped straight onto our home. But as the dust settles and my mind goes numb, I realise they're simply not here. I'm looking in the wrong place and I have no idea where they might be. I stumble out of the broken front door to catch my breath, choking on dust. I wipe my burning eyes with a sleeve, but it does nothing. Blood has chased down my arm from my broken nail, which has split in two. I know I should feel the pain of it, but I'm numb to everything, unable to formulate my next move. There's a high buzzing in my ear that stems from no magic, and my skin has gone cold with shock. I know it because it is a familiar sensation, one that drags me back to that other time, when Laura was just a toddler in my arms. I shake my head, trying to restore my senses. The sound of a great monster roars over another peal of thunder, and I look up at the rainless black clouds that spit electricity down on us. Is this hell, I think, recalling faintly the stories of our people, and a horrible place where the worst of mankind went after death. But children, could they have done anything so terrible as to warrant existing in a place like this? I take a steadying breath, my thoughts slowly collecting after the fright. This is not hell, I realise, this is Pratheka. I grit my teeth and rise, refusing to give in to the grief. No matter what comes our way, I can never give up on them. Even when Gidresu's hands were on me, my only thoughts were for Laura and the children. It doesn't matter that we are separated by blood. We are family. With renewed strength, I keep searching. Maybe if I look deeper, harder, I'll find them. Maybe they found refuge in the cellar, which has been barred by the wreckage. If only I can get to them in time, they'll be okay, and we can make a run for it together. A collapsed crossbeam lays across the entrance of the cellar. I'll have to move it if I have any hope of getting the trap door open. It's a long shot, but they could suffocate down there, and I would forever blame myself if they died. I don't know where the strength comes from, but I manage to roll the thick beam several feet until it gains momentum and tumbles to one side. There's still layers and layers of broken shingles and wood to bar me, but I'm closer than ever. Laura would have brought them here, I'm certain of it. It's that determination that fuels my exhausted body. I can rest when they're free and safe, far, far away from this nightmare. I can already imagine us eloping to the woods just outside of the settlement, and beyond, into the wilds of Jertle. It is a fantasy at this point, but I cling to it anyhow. I just want to see them again. I crave to hold them in my arms and witness their bright, mirthful smiles again, just like this morning, when they were squabbling over a muffin. Don't worry, I tell them, though I know they can't hear me. I'll get you out of there. I banish the tears, crying as for the dead. They can't be dead. If only Gidresu hadn't been hungry for power, he might have left me alone. My place is with my family, and I regret every moment that I was away from them. My hands are numb by the time I clear away the debris and grab the handle of the cellar door. There's a moment where I hesitate, too afraid to open it. What if they aren't there? I take a steadying breath and throw it open finding the cellar vacant of any living being. I sway on my feet, unable to believe it, and that numbness crawls into my soul again. No, is all I can say, the tears finally coming. They blur my vision and wash away the sting of dust. They're gone. I have to come to terms with that fact. I drop my head into a bloody hand and stifle a sob. The pain of their absence is overwhelming, and I sink to my heels, rocking as I hold myself. Gone they're gone. In the silence, the rubble is disturbed behind me. I whip around in hopes to see them, standing in the doorway. Maybe they found refuge after all, and had come back to salvage what they could. But my heart drops when I find what has made the sound. It is one of them, the monsters that attack the settlement. He's one of the taller ones, his onyx horns adding to his great height as he watches me with pale white eyes. There's a massive sword draped over his powerful yet lean shoulders, resting easily between the horns that jut out from the bones of his clavicles. I am stunned by the weight of his focus, unable to move. Has he come to kill me too?
Chapter 8 Giroth This one ignores the battle we've brought down onto the land, slipping away so that I almost lose her in the chase. I'm not sure why she has caught my attention, but I think it could be the gleam of purpose in her bright blue eyes. These humans are strange. Most have gone shrieking and flailing into the arms of my collectors, but this one has evaded all efforts from the dark elves and my soldiers to be caught. She ducks into the broken shell of a low building that has been destroyed in the confusion. Got you, I whisper as I stalk to the edge of the crumpled building. I think she means to hide, and I remain outside, watching as she digs through the ruins with feverish intent. What is she looking for, I wonder? And that's when I hear her voice, high and melodic, even as it's tight with worry. Matt! Elizabeth! There is nowhere for her to go. It gives me time to better observe her. She doesn't have the strong hips or formidable figure of some of the other women, and I doubt she would be a good candidate for King Asmodeus's experiment. Still, her ruddy flesh and golden hair fascinates me. I could imagine how she'd yield to my powerful claws, and I find myself wondering how her body might feel, pressed against mine. It is an errant thought that I dismiss immediately. When we return to Tilith, the humans will be given to the king, and I will have nothing more to do with them. I crave again the dark pits of the kennels. That is familiar. That is home. The harsh greens and blues of this continent assault my senses. I hate it. But I enjoy the glint of golden light off her hair as she strains against the impossible destruction, calling out words I don't recognize. Her alien features are precious in their own right. I'm used to seeing the hard, long ears of the matrons and the sharp, narrow features of other Volvoth. I like the soft shells of her strangely shaped ears that go red as she works tirelessly to burrow into the ruins. Her soft, clawless hands begin to bleed at the effort, and I catch the bite of copper in the air. Everything about her is new and curious. What are you doing? I ask in a whisper, more to myself than to her as I watch the way she digs and shouts. She does not act like the others of her kind who hide their flat eyes from us. Hers are sharp and seem to miss nothing except the shadow of me looming in the broken window. Are they animals? Like the king said? I don't know that I can believe it, not as I watch her. Animals react on instinct and will even abandon their own offspring when danger strikes. This one is hurting herself to find someone. I realize that now. She is destroying her tender limbs in search of them, without a care for her own well-being. It is what a sentient creature would do. What is going on inside that mind of yours? Another question she can neither hear nor answer. Hers are high ideals that would make the Seven proud. She does not ask for help from her cowering peers. She simply does, without consideration for herself. I can't help but grin and move to find a better position to watch her. As the battle rages all around us, she ignores it, stopping only once to take a breath, blood dripping from her fingers. Her eyes are distant, and she doesn't even see me before she goes back to her task, calling those words I'm beginning to understand as names. That's when she moves to the center of the rubble and pushes at a beam three times her length. I'm amused, as I know she won't be able to move the thing. I should be gathering more of the humans for the experiment, but I can't help myself. Her drive captivates me. Nothing deters her, and soon the beam goes rolling off the mound of rubble, but she doesn't stop to observe her success. Of course, she doesn't, digging frantically through the wreckage until she reaches a concealed trap door. Does she even realize she's injured? I move to the entrance, casting a heavy shadow over her doorstep. It would have been too small for me to enter when it was intact, but the ceiling has fallen away, allowing me the ease of access. I wait a little longer, hoisting my thick blade over my shoulder, urging her silently to finally see me. What will she do when she does? That is what I want to find out. See me, I urge her, though my voice couldn't be heard over the din of fighting even from here. That will tell me if she is truly sentient, or merely a frightened Urgen whelp reacting on impulse. Witness me, little one, I think, feeling the chaotic energy inside of me drawn to her. She flings the trap door open, then goes unusually still. 
does not seem like this one to surrender so easily. But she sinks to her haunches as she stares into the abyss below the ruined building. Her arms drop at her sides like she's finally given up. I tilt my head, wondering what is going through her mind at this moment. My turn, I breathe. I dare take a step forward and my heavy boot hits something hard. The noise makes her jump slightly and she whips around, her eyes filled with the sight of me. At first there is light in them, but that drains away for dark and dread. Did she think I was the person she was looking for? I almost feel pity for her. I remain still, impatient to see what she will do next. The others burst instantly into action, fleeing without a thought and leaving behind the rest, who were easy to collect. But she continues to surprise me, remaining still as a statue. It's as if she thinks I'll attack when she finally dares to blink. A small smile curves at the edges of my mouth, she has never seen a demon before today. That, I have no doubt. And she has never seen one up close. Not until this very moment. I expect her mouth to open, and for one of those wretched sounds to escape her. But her lips tighten instead, and that light returns to her eyes. The gleam of purpose. Despite her tiny stature and her narrow frame, I now have no doubt she will be a fine acquisition for my king and his experiment. I find myself resolved to collect her, despite all evidence to the contrary. And for myself, I want to feel her soft body writhe against me when I gather her up in my strong arms. I crave to feel her dull teeth in my flesh when she struggles, because I know she will. She's a fighter, this one, and she is more than just a wild animal. She is sentient and maybe she will come to understand the reason we have laid siege on her home. Maybe she will be a voice to the others, who shriek and wail inconsolably in their chains. I want to allay her with words of comfort, though it is not our way. She makes me feel something I have only experienced when an organ mother gives birth, that joy and uncertainty of the little lives springing out of her, already gnashing and full of spirit. I take another step forward and her body goes rigid. In several paces, I'll be within arm's reach. That is, if she doesn't try to flee, she has nowhere to go, with me blocking the only true exit from this ruined place. This will be an easy catch, even though she's nearly glowing with ambition. All I have to do is pin her down and secure a collar around her slender neck. I'll need to be careful so I don't snap it instead. I put a hand out to her open and facing up, so she knows I don't mean any real harm. She looks at it blankly, her gaze flitting back to my face and the sword over my shoulders. She is right to be cautious, but she doesn't need to be. I open my mouth to speak, when all at once she bolts in the opposite direction, scrambling with mad fury through a gap in the wall that I'd missed. Excitement rushes through me as I realize she's cleverer than I gave her credit for. Chapter 9. Cora. I spring into action, refusing to be caught by this monster. It's impossible to know what he has planned for me, but it must certainly be worse than Gidresu's lecherous attempts. Nothing with such frigid, calculating eyes could be so sincere, even if he did offer his hand to me. I don't buy his act for a second. You underestimate me, I mutter, my eyes gleaming as I escape. There's a long crack in the drywall that I slip through, trying to buy myself some time. It's not just for me that I run, but for Matt and Beth. For Laura, who, if she is still alive, will most certainly return to the house with the children. I need to lead him away from our home, or he might capture them as well. I've already risked my own life today, and I would gladly risk it again to ensure their future, however bleak it may be. Just as I squeeze between two broken frames, He's already crossed the heavy rubble and lunges, his razor-sharp claws missing me by a hair's breadth. My heart is galloping in my chest as I manage to free myself from the mess, rolling out just in time as he brings the wall down with a mighty sweep of his sword. Shit, I breathe, but it's the only second I waste. Quickly, I scramble to my feet and burst forward into a run, 
I don't have the luxury to glance behind me any longer, sensing that he's already in hot pursuit. If I do look back, I'm truly frightened of what I'll find. That creature doesn't call out to me or order me to stop. Hell, I don't know if he can speak in a language I understand. I don't care. He is my enemy as much as the Dark Elves. When I think I might be taking the lead, swerving through the battle-scarred streets, he manages to keep up, maintaining his grip on that massive sword of his. And though he has every opportunity to cut me down, he doesn't. It confuses me, but I don't have time to consider it. I peel through the streets and break through the tree line, hoping he gets bored of chasing me and goes back to the army of hellish spawn, decimating the Dark Elves' ranks. I want to enjoy the fact that Gidresu and his minions are being overwhelmed at the moment, but my focus remains on my feet, pedalling hard beneath me. I know better than to scream. Even from this distance, the sound of women shrieking can be heard. And where has it gotten them? Trapped or killed? And I will not put myself among their ranks. Sweat beads on my forehead, and I push harder than ever. My heart feels like it's about to burst, and my breath is coming in ragged gasps. Still, I run. Trees shudder behind me as he tries to navigate them, those thick branches too knotted for him to slip easily through. Finally, I have the luxury to glance over my shoulder and find him cutting through the thicket with battle-hardened fury. He is almost twice my height, a being of pure pale muscle with the strength of five men. The way he wields his weapon makes me think he's already cut down a number of us before he got to me. What confuses me most is the way he was standing in the doorframe, just staring at me. He could have come upon me and knocked me out while I was searching for Matt and Beth. He could have cut me in half when I was staring into the cellar. But he didn't. He wanted something from me. That was the sign he'd given me, his palm open as if he was asking me to take his hand. If he could speak, why didn't he? Still, he could say something coherent, reasonable, long enough to make me realise he is, in fact, cognizant. Is he an enemy of the Dark Elves? If so, why are they attacking us too? This has to be some grab for power by a race we've never seen before. But what do they want? Nephthirium? Land? I swallow hard as I chase that elusive freedom. Slaves? I will not be made a slave again, not while my family is out there, somewhere. They need me, and if I had to choose between masters, I wouldn't hesitate to return to the Dark Elves. The thought is a hateful one. I can't stand the idea of going back to them with my tail tucked between my legs, as if Gidresu was a generous master in the first place. I scramble over a low hillock as the creature bursts free of the thicket, his blade drawn, his pale gaze homed in on me. My limbs are on fire with overexertion, but I stifle a surprise shout, nearly tumbling down the hill in retreat. There's something so infuriating about this creature. He just won't give up. Your enemy is behind you. I mutter beneath my breath, though I want to shout it at him. Not me. Compared to these giants, I am diminutive and cannot fathom that I hold any worth to them. Perhaps they do not tolerate rejection, and he has taken offence to it. If he was so grounded in propriety, however, then why hasn't he spoken yet? I land in a heap at the bottom of the steep hill, and he comes sliding after on his heavy leather boots, not giving me an inch. Again, I'm forced to dodge his reach twice before I round a thick tree, rolling as he swipes for me. This close, I can feel that dark energy rolling off him. I don't need to be a dark elf to feel it deep inside of me, like a frigid current lapping against my bones. I pull back violently, sweeping up a stick and brandishing it against him. Stay away from me, I warn. He looks at the weapon, confusion coming over his sharp features. With the flick of a wrist, the tip of his weapon disarms me sending the branch flying into the trees. It was as easy as breathing for him, the accuracy not lost on me. He could have flicked it across my throat and watched me bleed out at his feet. Instead, he approaches even as I back away. The woods have gotten denser here, and I have no place left to run. That's when I spot a break in the bushes and an open field beyond. It could be my last chance to get away from him. I take a big breath, then leap through the gap, rolling on the exit onto a grassy knoll. As I rise, a weight bears down on me, forcing me onto my back. He has pinned me to the earth, his weapon cast aside to hold me fast. There's something cold and metal in his other hand, and I recognise it immediately. A collar. With all my might, I surge against his unyielding bulk, flailing and finally losing myself to a scream. His ears drop back against his head as if the sound irritates him. 
My leg comes up and I knee him in the jaw, forcing him to let me go. I scramble out from beneath him, only to be dragged back under. This time, though, his expression is fierce, and instead of a collar, his bare palm presses against my forehead, shoving my head back against the grass. I fight the sensation that his touch summons, writhing against that heavy blackness that threatens to overtake my vision. But there's something so sweet about oblivion, and I finally surrender to it as it drags me down, 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 into its velvet depths. Chapter 10 Giroth My frustration has gotten the better of me, and I put her to sleep with just a touch of my chaotic energy that flows through all demons. But now that she's unconscious, I can admire her wherewithal. She fought valiantly against her capture, going so far as to threaten me with a puny little stick when all the odds were against her. Her face is soft in sleep as I hoist her small form over my shoulder and carry her back to the settlement, content with my haul. Even as I consider that she'll make a fine breeder, the thought sits wrong in my gut. That's not all she's worth, though I don't know if anyone else will recognize it once we return to Tealeth. I decide to keep her with me on the return journey in case the others get too curious about her. I like this one. Several Trollvor soldiers meet me at the border, where the battle has sufficiently died down. Honorable Giroth one says in an outward show of respect, his slitted eyes straying only briefly to the woman over my shoulder. I suppose it is better than Houndmaster. We have their leader waiting for your judgment. And what of the battle? It is over, says the other with a sharp nod, sheathing his wicked scimitar at his side. We have rounded up the remaining viable humans and are awaiting the Sazgaroth summons from Tealeth. Very good, I say rubbing out the delicious pain in my jaw. She has a mighty strike, I'll give her that. They escort me to the center of the settlement, where a bloody dark elf trembles on the ground in a fetal position, as if he's already been beaten within an inch of his life. Beside the reclined Gilak sit what must be two dozen human women chained hand and foot, pale with fright and weeping loudly, as if I have any empathy for them. This one did not weep, I think clutching her limp body closer. My soldiers wait for my orders, and I look over the crowd, glad we did not lose any today. The king will be pleased. This is their leader, I say of the trembling dark elf, who hasn't dared move from his childlike pose in the grass. Yes, Honorable Giroth. At his mention he finally looks up at me, his pupils pinpoints in beady black eyes so big, I think they'll fall out of his skull. Demon, he whispers reverently, scrambling up to his knees, though the action seems painful. Please, have mercy on an old elf. I can get you more women, money, land, whatever you want. Just don't kill me. He crawls forward on hands and knees, reaching for my boots with bloody fingers. Master, I'll do whatever you command. I step out of his reach, disgusted. Were they all like this? Most died with our boots to their throats, one of the Trollvor replies. Their magic was useless against the chaos. As I saw, I circle the leader. This is pathetic, Dark Elf. I've met Urgen pups with more self-respect than you. His bloody grin angles up at me, desperate and thin. Who needs self-respect when they have money? I, I have connections. I know the Sorcerer King himself. You'd be a fool to spurn my friendship, O oh powerful demon. All that I have can be yours if you spare me my life. I know people. He prattles on about his precious connections, but I tire of his excuses. The only connection you should be worried about is that of your head to your body, elf. I spit at him. Then to my soldiers. Take him away and drown him in that great lake to the south then have his body given to the Naga. I'm sure they'll make good use of such a generous gift. 
Yes, Honorable Giroth, they say in unison, and drag him away. He goes kicking and screaming like a petulant babe. It is an honor to die for your people, but he has no loyalty to his, that is plain to see. I look down at our hall, of the women that the king demanded for me to gather. I am pleased with how many there are, though we'll soon learn if they'll be of any use. One of the women raises her head, her eyes strangely clear compared to the others. She watches me, her gaze straying often to the woman draped over my shoulder. Do they know one another? And if so, what connection do they have? I forget the curiosity, eager to be home. Stand up, I demand, and they do so slowly, as if their bodies are heavy with grief. Surely Tealeth will be a better place than this slave camp filled with dead dark elf soldiers, even if they will be used as mere vessels for the demon king's spawn. I have no pity for them. The storm overhead swells in intensity, and I know our return journey is imminent. Those that set off to drown the leader have returned, and I number their heads again to be sure everyone is accounted for. Twenty-three women and fifty-one demons are shrouded in the heavy chaos magic of our home continent that floats leagues above us. The massive Gilak grunts in displeasure, as he is the first to go blind in the swirling vortex because his head is higher than the rest of ours. Then the others go blind too, who accept the curling darkness like a mother's embrace. Before my eyes darken with magic, I let the human woman slide into my arms and cradle her unconscious form against my chest. I don't want anything to happen to her during the transfer, and I feel she is safest here with me. She has promise. The soft, innocent expression on her face is precious. It is a side of her I never saw when she was lucid, her eyes shadowed with fear and defiance and anticipation. Like this, though, I am taken by her beauty and gentle strength. My jaw still aches from her resounding strike from before. I find myself grinning down at her like a fool. I'm glad the others can't see me. They would never stop talking about it. I look up at that thunderous cloud that envelops us all, closing my eyes to ease the passage between the ground continent and Tylith, and when it clears, I sway in the courtyard of the royal estate and breathe the fresh, clean air of home. The other humans sob with more emphasis, their wide eyes panning the high city with fear and disgust. There is much to do before I can give my report to the king. These women will have to be processed, documented, and vetted thoroughly so that we can properly account for them. At least below I could have a little fun and kill some dark elves. Now it is all paperwork. Chapter 11. Cora. I gag myself awake. The stench is making my eyes water. It's so potent I can taste it in the back of my throat. Something cold and wet drips onto my face. Fuck. I hope it's water, but I know I'm not that lucky. As I sit up, my back scratches the rusty bars. I glance around at the other prisoners, and relief blazes through me. They're not here, the kids or Laura. They got away. I know it. They are so smart. I know they would go and find somewhere safe. Cora. A whisper catches my attention. I move over next to her. They're all scared, just like me. Our futures are uncertain with certain outcomes. None are ideal. Don't worry, I say, taking her hand. We'll get through this. I give my best smile. I have no idea how we were getting out of this, but I know it wouldn't be without a fight. Her face contorts and tears roll down. Cora, I'm so sorry, she cries. It's not your fault, it's none of our faults, just... No, she says louder. Laura, she... Her voice cracks and she breaks into a full sob. I lean in and rub her back. Is safe with the kids, they're... They took her, she blurts out. My body goes cold. My limbs feel like boulders. What do you mean? She was here, she sniffs. Watching over you, then they came. They took her. The room seems to spin. No, this isn't right. She's upset and confused. Laura got away with the others. Are you sure? Today has been tough for everyone. We can see anything, I say. It wasn't true. Can't be. 
It was Laura. Two enormous guards dragged her from this cell. She hasn't been back since. Her eyes are puffy. They dart around as if someone would descend on us at any moment. That was a very likely possibility at this point. From her expression, I know it is true. Laura was taken. I want to puke, and it's not from the shit surrounding us. Images pop into my mind from our childhood. The happy, chubby red cheek girl I protected all this time. I failed, and now she's in the clutches of those monsters. That dipping water seems so loud now. My mind races for an answer. Why her? Why no one else? Is she being tortured? Then my mind runs to the dark places. What are they doing to her? I can't breathe. My little sister. The woman recoils back. She tries to pry my hand from her wrist. You're hurting me, she gasps. I immediately release her. I'm sorry, sorry. How long was I out? When did they take her? She rubs her wrist. You were sleeping for about ten hours. Then they took her about six hours ago. And she hasn't been back? I've told you no. She's gone, she says with tears in her eyes. It doesn't add up. Why? She's quiet. I taught her what to do. Keep her head down and don't draw attention to herself. They'll overlook you as long as possible. Did she try to protect me? Oh my God. The thought alone makes me sicker than this place. I'll never forgive myself. I should have done more. Those curved black pointed horns came to mind along with his milky white eyes and tall frame. It sends a chill down my spine. The rolling forest as I ran laid out before my eyes. How didn't I get away? I was precise. I replay the events and come up with ways for me to avoid this. My capture. Maybe I could have run faster. I avoided him well enough. Perhaps take an extra turn and fight harder. Taking a life never came to mind before, but knowing they have my sister. It seems like it would have been the best choice if I had the chance, resources and opportunity. I should have done more. There was more I could have done. Just as the thought crosses my mind, I push it aside. Dwelling on my failures wouldn't get me anywhere. I have to focus on the positive. The kids got away. That's what matters. They were saved. That has to count for something, right? It has to. It's one of the last things I have left to cling to. If me... Being here gives them a chance. I'll take that any day. I take a breath and look around me. The women huddle in small groups. There are so many of us here. Most were shivering. Whether it was from fear or the wet conditions was a mystery. It could even be both. We need a plan. I can't just sit here. I have to do something. Anything. There's a metal bowl of water on the floor. I grab it and pass it around for everyone to get a small drink. After it's empty, I run it across the bars as loud as possible. Hey, guards! Oh my God, Cora, what are you doing? She says, trying to pull me back from the bars. Getting answers. We need to know what's going on. She sighs. Fuck it. What do we have to lose? That was one way to look at it, but I still have a lot to lose. People who depend on me are waiting for me. Matt and Beth are waiting, and I won't disappoint them. I'll get Laura, and we'll get back to them. I continue my campaign to everyone's dismay. It could end badly, but that's what we were expecting since being tossed in these cells. When the wooden door finally crashes into the wall, my throat is almost sore. Two hulking guards rush in, glaring at my antics. They stop in front of me, hoping I will quit. They hoped wrong. About time. What are the two of you doing out there? Sleeping on the job? I yell, tapping the bowl. One of them snatches the bowl and throws it across the room. The women push to the back of the cell. I hold my position at the bars. You got a lot of nerve, he says. The woman you took from here, where is she? He looks at his partner, and they share a glance. What are you going to do with us? I press. You don't get to ask questions around here. Shut it or suffer, he yells. That goes for all of you. Fine, something easy. Where are we? You know that, don't you? I ask. So neither of you have any answers? A woman behind me asks. It sparks a chain reaction among the group. Soon others join in hurling questions at them. Some approach the cell door right next to me. Bring us someone who does know then, I say. He glares at me and smacks the bar next to my face. The ringing sound echoes in my ear, but I stay strong. The guards whisper among themselves, then make a hasty retreat. 
The door slams so hard that I think it will fall off the hinges the next time someone opens it. I check around the cell for anything that we could use. Why wait for answers if we could escape and get them ourselves? As the others keep making noise, I shake the small bench, and it wobbles. One of the legs is loose, an idea comes to mind, and I rush over to the cell door. This could work. Chapter 12 Giroth A successful haul of human women will surely put me in good favor with Asmodeus, though this is not something that I care too much about. If it were up to me, I would have already returned to my hounds, but now there is processing to do. I find myself tired, the effects of the chaos magic and the battle now starting to catch up with me. It's been a long time since I have expended so much energy, Plus, the weight of expectation that hung on my shoulders must have taken more of it than I realized. If I had not been successful in this mission, then my very life would have been at stake. My eyes are heavy and my body will soon become a dead weight. My shoulders are stiff with tension, and I have little left in the way of concentration, though there is still much work to do. If I can just get this completed, then hopefully my role in all of this will be finished. I sit back in my chair and look up at the dark ceiling. This is not what I am made for. My jaw throbs still, and all I want to do is get back to where I belong. Collecting humans was a surprisingly welcome distraction from the monotony of my life here on Tealeith, but I am done now. A knock on the door brings me back into the room. Yes! My tone is less than patient as the door opens and a guard steps in. What is it? I snap, returning to my work and not looking up from my desk. I don't need others to see that I am feeling weary or think that I may not be up to the job. I'm sorry to disturb you, he says, and I can feel how little he means it. The times that us demons are sorry are few and far between. It is not a feeling that resonates with us. Then why do you? I ask. There's a woman, a human. Yes. There are many of them. I brought them here, I say wryly. I don't have the time or the patience for interruptions like this. My anger will soon get the better of me if I do not dispense with these duties soon and return to my hounds and the life that I know. There is one in particular that is causing a problem, Giroth. Oh, I return noncommittally, shuffling through the papers that seem to be placed here just to torture me. She is riling up the other women. Causing a scene. She insists on speaking with you. Why me? Why is it always me? This is the last thing that I need. Not for this job to become even more of a chore than it already is. Then it hits me. Who out of all these women would ask for me? Most of them are in desperate fear for their lives. There is only one that has challenged me thus far. Something in me stirs. And finally I look up at the guard. His face looks like I feel, and I can tell he has also had enough of this nonsense. This woman, what does she look like? He gazes back at me, almost stupefied. Like the rest of them, human. We collected many. They are all different. Is she short, tall? What is the color of her hair? I challenge, shocked by the interest that this news now raises in me. She is... Well, her hair is golden and rests at her shoulders. She is one of the most beguiling of them. I see the shift in his eyes and I narrow my own at him. These women are here for breeding purposes, that is true, but the way he speaks makes me uncomfortable. It is her. It must be. The tightness in my body eases, and a warm and unfamiliar feeling erupts in my chest. Of course, it would be her causing the trouble. Everything about her screams trouble, and a lot more besides. All of a sudden, the weariness I was experiencing has moved on and been replaced with something new. Very well, I offer, rising from my desk. Then I will accept an audience with her. My voice is harsh, gruff, and does not betray that deep down. I am looking forward to seeing the human woman again. It is not usual for me, 
but I cannot help but recall how she felt in my arms. So soft, so warm, so different to anything I have known before. I am indebted to you, Giroth. I fear if you did not grant her wish, then we would have a rebellion on our hands. I gazed at him in disbelief, my voice laced with sarcasm. We are demons. You are saying we can't control a group of human women. No, I am just remarking that... Forget it! I snap. Let us go and deal with this situation. If I am the only one that can deal with this woman, then so be it. In truth, I want to be the only one to deal with her. The thought of this task falling to another is not something I want to entertain. I storm out of the office with the guard trailing behind me, crossing the grounds quickly until we get to the cell blocks. The smell is worse than that of the kennels, and I have to cover my nose as we enter the grim buildings. It's a place that could make even a demon's skin crawl, a place that is not fit even for the worst-behaved hounds. Not that I deal with many of those. Urkins are more favorable to me than anything or anyone else. The sounds of the women can be heard from the entryway, and I smirk at their helplessness, at their whispers and cries and sniffles. Slowly, quietly, I make my way to the large cells where they are all contained, the darkness masking me as I creep towards them. That's when I see her. In her hand is a large hunk of wood, and she is trying to pry the cell door loose, failing miserably as the other women try to help her. The look on her face is one of sheer determination, a look that I am already familiar with, and something about it brings a smirk to my lips. Tilting my head, I observe her with amusement, wondering how she could even think such a stupid plan would work. But there is something that draws me to this strange and frustrating human. I did not expect one of their kind to even be capable of such strength of character. She has no magic, no physical strength, and yet she seems to believe herself to have agency of some kind. She looks up, as though sensing me there, her face stricken when her eyes catch my own. Instantly I am rewarded for my patience with the wood that she uses as a projectile, somehow managing to produce a surprising force through the bars of the cell. That damned woman! I block the wood with a solid forearm, wondering what else this infuriating yet somewhat courageous human has to throw at me next, having already taken a blow, and now this. Still my anger surges to the fore. She intrigues me, that is for sure, but I am still a demon and not to be trifled with. Surely she should know this by now. She saw what I and others like me are capable of. She must know that if she continues in this way, things will not go well for her. I bear my canines at her, my words aimed at her like weapons. I liked you better scared. Thank you so much for listening. This channel is supported by that subscribe button right below. If you would like to show support for more content like this, please click that button and join our growing community with membership perks, giveaways, coupons, and more. Chapter 13 Cora I couldn't be afraid of you, I bite back, both surprised and furious that he speaks in a language I can understand, and that he can talk at all. He could have said something while he was chasing me through the settlement, instead of trying to scare the living daylights out of me. Then I recall that collar he brandished, the one he'd intended to clap around my neck and feel myself flush with true rage. How dare you kidnap us and leave us in this reeking dungeon to starve? His eyes are narrowed, and his expression doesn't change as he waves the guards away. I'll take care of this one. Leave us, he says to them. They look at each other before departing, shutting the door behind themselves. You ruined our lives, I continue, all my frustration rushing out of me at once, as I grab the bars of the cage and shake with all my might. It doesn't even rattle them. You destroyed our settlement and could have killed my siblings in the process. Why didn't you say anything? You hunted me down like an animal out there. I continue, my voice catching and tears of true fury springing to my eyes. Nothing I say changes that steeled expression on his face, like he doesn't have a heart in that broad chest of his. I thought you were going to kill me. Something in his eyes finally flares, but he smothers it with a frown. Don't think for a moment that I won't, still. Where the other women were rallied by my fury, they drop back against the wall, hushing even their quiet murmurs. He likes to play at frightening, but I know better. 
When it was just he and I, racing through the woods, he had no intention of killing me. And he doesn't now. A hateful grin comes over me. Bullshit. You need us. I don't know why, but you wouldn't have gone through all the trouble to collect us alive, for whatever evil plans you have. Nothing good could come from monsters like you. And believe me, we know a monster when we see one. I look him up and down to make my point, as the women behind me suck in a collective breath. I'm playing with fire, and I know I'll get burned, but I need to know how deep his facade goes. He's a poor liar, that's for sure. He can hardly keep his burgeoning emotions in check any longer, which I've just discovered that he has none at all. You could have killed me and you didn't. Why? I swear, his pale eyes narrow a little more. His jaw works, and he glances away, throwing a clawed hand through his ebony hair. You are a human. You do not question a demon's motives. Demon, I think, pulling back from the bars to better take in his tall, curved horns and powerful build. Is that what you are? A demon? He says nothing. Well, I say, trying not to let my resentment leak into my voice, and failing miserably. I am here, questioning your motives, demon, because you took my sister away from me, and I have no idea what you and your kind are doing to her as we speak. His gaze flits back to me, surprise and confusion coming over him as he scrutinises me with those unnerving eyes. I don't have your sister. Yes, you do, I say, cradling my injured hands against my chest. I've almost forgotten about them in all the excitement. You took her while I was out cold, and you need to give her back. Until I see that she's safe and sound, I'm not going to stop fighting with every inch of my being. She is all I have left. A troubled expression dawns on his pallid face, and he shakes his head. I have not had anyone removed from the cell. I grit my teeth so tightly I think they're going to break. You expect me to trust you over my own friends? I wave to the women behind me, who shrink from the attention I impose on them. They have no reason to lie to me, demon. But you do. We stare at one another so hard, I can feel a storm brewing between us. The longer I stare, the less imposing he seems. Why was I afraid of him in the first place? He's a big brute, like the dark elves that throw around their weight with no reason behind it other than they know they can get away with it. I'm tired of putting up with it, tired of watching my friends get hurt and killed because we're considered a lesser race. The next I speak, it's slow and commanding. Give. Her. Back. He bears his long canines at me in a grimace. I told you. I'm tired of your lies, I interrupt, silencing the demon, though my emotions threaten to overwhelm me. Laura may be only a few years younger than me, but she needs my protection, and I'd go insane if I knew I could protect her and did nothing. Please, I say, leaning against the cell bars. Just give her back to me. His answer is cool and final. I didn't take her. But when I look up, he is scanning the women behind me one by one, as if he's counting them, or looking for something he doesn't find. When he's finished, that hard expression comes over him again, and he pulls out a set of keys, flipping through them slowly. My heart leaps into my mouth, and I wonder if I've finally reached the end of his patience. I don't back away like the others do when he finds the key he's looking for and pops the cell door open. I can't show fear now that I know he's fully cognizant. I'll suffer his wrath without giving him the gratification of hearing me plead for my life. I just want to see Laura again. With lightning speed, he grabs my wrist, dragging me out of the cage before slamming it behind me. His claws dig into my flesh as he drags me against him so I can feel that hateful energy rolling over me. Don't you dare question your betters, human. I keep my mouth screwed tight as he yanks me towards the door. I asked for this. I kept pushing him, knowing his patience was already running thin. I accused him of lying and undermined his authority. Whatever comes next is the natural consequence of pissing off a demon. A shiver passes over me, and I go cold. In one last fleeting glance, I look to the women still caged and shivering in the cell. Their eyes are darkened with horror at my fate as they glance away, refusing to look at me. Cowards, I think with disgust, furious at them for being too afraid to stand up for themselves. They go quietly into the arms of their captors, and that is why they are slaves. I am a slave because I refuse to watch my sister die. I stood for what I believed in then, and I will continue to do so now, despite the monsters all around us. 
They may hurt me and take my agency, but they will never break me, and especially not this one, whose grip is far too tight. Chapter 14 Giroth One of the humans is missing. I try to focus on that conundrum as the woman is struggling in my grip. Her protests run together in a string of unfamiliar intonations, and it's easy to block them out. She has more spirit than I assumed, and it's going to get her in trouble on Tileth. How can she be bred if she won't shut up? There is also the injury to my authority that must be handled. She mouthed off in front of the guards, and she cannot be seen to have dodged the consequences. Not when my command is already tentative at best. The Demon King might have left this task to me, but that does not mean that I am in the other Volvath's favor. I am merely the Kennel Master. How I'd love to drag my claws through her tender flesh and hear her scream again. But I also know that it could very well kill her. She is not so sturdy as a demon, and may fall to pieces if I handle her too roughly. Even my firm grip I keep in check, refusing to damage her rosy flesh unnecessarily. No matter how she struggles, she is as soft as she was in the wilds of Protheca. I don't know what I intend to do with her, but I at least have to make a show of punishing her poor behavior. I wouldn't have tolerated half of her obstinance from a wild Urgen hound. You cannot just drag me around. Where are you taking me? I ignore her, guiding her past a host of Trollvor guards. She goes quiet upon seeing their canine features, the muscles of her arm flexing beneath my touch. Is it fear she's feeling? She can spare no reverence for a Volvath, but a Trollvor manages to mute her. I'm almost offended. I don a heated scowl and yank her forward, forcing her feet to move. She will not make a fool of me in front of the King's guard. Finally, we enter my private office and I toss her in before shutting the door behind me. You petulant little human, I growl, blocking her exit as she rubs her wrist. Without the good sense to keep your mouth shut, you will learn who is in charge here. Her bright blue eyes glitter with indignant rage, but she finally stops talking, her lower lip trembling as if it's some great feat to keep her tongue from wagging. The silence that follows is charged, as if she'll burst if she does not fill my ears with drivel. I don't want to lock the door. She won't get far. If she does decide to run, the Trollvor will catch her, and then the King will most certainly get involved. But I can't have that. So I turn the lock, then secure the one above it, beyond her short reach. Now, I say, playing it calm, though I am the furthest thing from it. Isn't that better? She crosses her slender arms furiously. I look her up and down measuring her against my expectations. King Asmodeus described humans as docile and obedient. He did not warn me that there would be such troublesome creatures such as she among them. She doesn't even appear to be of the same stock as the others, who aligned quite closely to the king's description. I enjoy the silence a little longer before I move to sit. As soon as I look away, however, she begins again. Listen here. You have no right to keep us in such terrible conditions she protests. Those women are injured, and they will get sick in a place like that. You cannot leave them to... Before I even consider my actions, I've dragged her against the wall, pressing my hand against her sternum so as to pin her to the spot. Her inhalations grow shallow, and her cool, sweet breath mingles with mine. Up close I can see the appeal. She licks her full lips, her mouth parting as if the words have finally abandoned her. Her eyes flit between mine and my mouth as I speak, low and threatening. No, you listen. There are rules in Tylith, and you will abide them. Beneath my hand I can feel a warm organ increasing in pace, thudding a rapid rhythm into my palm. Fear, I think to myself, enjoying the scent of it washing off her. That's better. She lets her head fall back, and her eyes are guarded. What rules? This woman never ceases to surprise me. Though her body radiates a visceral terror, she maintains a look of disinterest, even defiance. I'll take what I can get out of this one. A 
bare my sharpened teeth at her throat, nudging her chin up as if I mean to sink my teeth in. You are a human, and will follow my every command without question. A sound of irritation escapes her throat, but she does not interrupt. I back up to gauge her hard expression. Here, in Tileith, there are creatures that would snap you up in their jaws and tear you to pieces without a second thought. They have never seen a human before, and might mistake you for their supper. Those other humans are in the safest place for them, for the time being. If they got out, I break off, running my dark tongue over my teeth. Their lives would be forfeit. Her eyes go round as she takes in my words, and her jaw clenches. Now, as for you... I let the threat hang in the air, satisfied when she swallows hard. Be good, and maybe you'll live to serve your purpose on the island. And what purpose is that? Her simple question makes me halt. I have other things to worry about, such as where the missing human has gone and the pile of paperwork that awaits me. But if she knew what we intended for her friends and for her, she would certainly try to escape. I chew on that thought then finally come up with an answer. You will serve a higher cause here than living in squalor beneath your dark elf masters. Says you, she retorts. We are slaves, just the same. So, you are, I conclude, refusing to deny the truth of it. And you will satisfy your obligations in silence, and gladly, for it is the king who has demanded your devotion. Her lip is trembling again. He is no king of mine. I can't help but laugh at her defiance, shattering the rising tension with my raking chuckle. It seems to stir her better judgment, and she goes quiet again. He is now. I pretend to lose interest in her, withdrawing to leave her to tremble. I could shackle her to the floor, but it is too much trouble. She can't go anywhere, and I feel that I've sufficiently smothered her rebellious spirit at least for the time being. Surely when she's feeling indignant again, she'll make it known. I have work to do, I say dismissively, sitting in front of the massive pile of paperwork I still have to go through. Out of the corner of my eye I watch her sink to the floor, her fingers tangled in her golden hair as she comes to terms with her fate. And though I get back to my work, that familiar misery remains at bay. With her around... It's almost as if I'm back in the kennels with my Urgen hounds. Not exactly happy, but it's not all that bleak either. There's the trouble of her sister, though. Someone has taken one of my humans while I wasn't looking. It is my job to handle them, and still, they went over my head and snatched one anyway. I'll have to speak with the king about it, but in the meantime, maybe this little spitfire can tell me more about the missing human woman. Chapter 15. Cora. I have been concerned about everyone else for so long, I have forgotten what is like to fear for my own life. This creature, this demon, is persistent in reminding me. I recall his sharp teeth at my throat and the pressure of his hand against my chest. Still, though, there's an undeniable heat growing in me. I resent it as I resent him, shooting him a hateful look as he scratches away at a document in front of him. One of many. He seems to have grown bored of me, irreverent to the fact that I am still here, stuck in this dreary room with him. He simply doesn't care. We are an acquisition for his king and nothing more. We are parcels to be documented and traded without say of our own future. And my sister is out there somewhere facing it all alone. Angry tears come. They seem to be the only kind I can spare today. I press them away with a palm and bite my lip until it hurts. Damn you, I think glaring up at him in the silence. His quill flits over the page without slowing, all of his concentration homed in on whatever ridiculous work he's conducting. This room is suffocating and it's not just him, it's me. Despite everything, he made my heart race. That heat chased through my core when I thought he might kiss me, even though his lips dripped with poison. I could not be attracted to such a monster. It's impossible and still here I am. Perhaps it is why I rail so hard against him. He pursued me tirelessly with his massive great sword, 
and then dragged me through the halls of this miserable dungeon to shame me into obedience. I have every reason to despise this bastard, but instead I'm troubled. I shouldn't feel this way. I have to stifle this feeling before it becomes a monster of its own, one I cannot ever hope to reason with. I look at him again, studying his high cheekbones and severe expression, his pale face haloed in dark hair that sits loosely over his broad shoulders. He has the long ears of an elf, but they're tipped with ebony and could not be confused. He is fastidiously stern. That seems to be his neutral. He must hate his job, I think, and almost find humour in the notion. But the walls of this place are steeped in misery, blunting any real amusement I might feel. Down on Protheca, I may have been fooled by the good weather and fresh breeze of the settlement. Here, there is no doubt I am a slave, and that I have no purpose but what they decide for me. I rake my hands through my hair again and groan. He ignores me, but his quill catches for the briefest moment. There's power in making him stumble. I can't smile exactly, but the smallest victory tastes sweet compared to the bitter truth of wearing his chains. I dare to glance over at him from underneath my lashes. He doesn't seem to have looked up, but his black brow is furrowed now in a furious attempt to concentrate. In a sudden motion, he pushes the page aside and grabs another one, continuing his mad scrawl. I notice that beyond him, against the tall stone wall, rests that massive sword he was wielding before in Jertil. I would have no hope in lifting it. That would take far more strength than I have ever possessed. But he managed it with ease, taking down a quarter of a building in a single swing. I'd be an idiot to annoy him. And an idiot I must be. I stand abruptly, tired of this power play of his. How dare you tell me how to act, I say, letting the words linger between us. As I hoped, his quill freezes over the page, though he doesn't look up. I believe a gag will suit you well, he concludes, continuing to write as if neither of us had spoken. I storm forward and smack my hands on the desk, sufficiently jarring him from his work. He slams his quill down beneath a powerful palm, splatting ink all over his spidery writing, then straightens to meet my gaze, his white eyes bright with hateful glee. I've already forgotten how overwhelming his attention is, but I only falter for a second. I don't think you heard me, I speak low, so that his ears are forced to perk up. I do not belong to you, and you will not tell me what to do or how to act. His smile spreads into a grin, flashing those savage teeth. Then he stands, making the table shudder as he rises to his full height. Even from across the table, I realise he's taller than I remember but I hold myself rigid in defiance. That voice of his cuts through me. Give me an excuse to punish you, human. As I open my mouth to speak, he's already gathered me up by my collar and dragged me over the desk, so I get an up-close view of his snarl. I brace myself, covering my face with an elbow as my feet dangle in the air. His hot breath washes over me. You just don't know when to give up. I could say the same, I dare tell him, knowing how close he is to eating me himself. This is all your fault. When he doesn't respond, I look up into his pale eyes, staring into the face of murder incarnate. If this is my last moment alive, I might as well make the most of it. If you had just left me and my sister alone, we wouldn't be here, and she wouldn't have gotten lost. Something changes in his expression, something I can hardly define, but it softens the muscled edges of his jaw, and the skin around his eyes. It disappears for a hard-edged sneer as soon as he seems to realise something. You could not run from me on Protheca, and you cannot run from me here. You should learn to submit to your betters. I would, I say, my face burning up with quiet rage. But I have not found them yet. That hits its mark, and he is stunned into silence briefly. I like it when I catch him off guard. It gives me a glimpse of his inner thoughts, and I'm starting to realise he's not used to being in control. You're nobody's master, I say, inspired by my realisation. You have no authority at all, do you? He drops me instantly, and I think he's going to storm away, but he pivots instead, his motion a blur, as he steals his great sword and puts the keen edge to my neck, pressing me hard against the desk. This time, his eyes are not bright, but a heavy shadow is cast over them. His horns are lowered as if he means to make good use of their points. Say another word. To both our surprise, I bare my neck to him and feel the bite of his blade against my flesh. Do it, 
I tell him, my mouth turned down. You've taken everything else from me. Chapter 16 Giroth My blade is to her throat, and still she will not give up. She must be mad if she is willing to risk her life, gambling on my goodwill. All the signs of fear are there, her racing heart and dilated pupils, her trembling limbs. I have her pressed hard against the wood, so I feel the minute quake in her core when she thinks I'm going to slice her throat open. If only the Zonak were so brave, I'd lob them at our enemies myself. Her resolve is harder than stone and I have to admire it. Her nostrils flare, yet she maintains a stoic stance, all things considered. My sword arm holds. The steel of my limbs is steadfast, so I know I won't cut her by accident. Only if she moves or I decide she's not worth the trouble, will that blade slice through that pretty neck. Her eyes narrow. Is this a game to you? I find myself asking. On the contrary, she says evenly, I find the situation to be quite grave. How she infuriates me! No matter what I say, she is one step ahead with her wry human quips. She has read into me more thoroughly than a Sazgaroth, already aware that I am not exactly what I present myself to be. Does she smell the ergon on me? It makes me no less deadly, and she seems to know it. Equally, she doesn't seem to care. How can I master a creature that does not fear death? The ultimate threat is useless against her. With that knowledge, I lower the blade and let her stand on her own two feet. She wavers and leans against the desk, as if my weight had been the only thing keeping her steady. And she feels her neck. When she speaks, her voice is hoarse, and I have to strain to hear it. Another trick of yours? My scoff makes her flinch, but I'm glad she has some semblance of natural instincts. It is healthy for a delicate creature such as herself. I'm not keen on tricks, human. Her accusing eyes flicker up to meet mine. Is this how you treat all your guests? With a blade to their throat? Only the ones that annoy me, I retort, putting away my weapon. I don't know when I developed a soft spot for this human, but I suspect it was in the very beginning when I saw her clawing through the rubble of her home. My gaze drops to her raw hands, and she tries to hide them. I ignore the gesture and hold out my own hand. Let me see them. See what? Don't be coy, I snap, then grab her wrist to expose her cracked hands. One nail is split, likely from where the blood had sprung. Most of it has dried and flaked, but the injury needs to be treated if it is to heal correctly. I turn her hands over, sensing that she stopped breathing, and glance at her face to ensure she's not going into shock. You're injured. Her lips purse tight. I find my seat and draw her into my lap, her wrists still locked in my grip. With the other hand, I rifle through the drawers of the desk, which has only recently been bestowed upon me. It's not really mine, but I do hope the previous owner had some salve tucked away. It's not uncommon for Scriveners to have it in abundance. Sure enough, there's a jar, half used, and I pry it open with my teeth and dip my finger into the muddy paste. She watches my every move, her fingers curling when I try to apply it. Still, she doesn't seem to understand who is in charge. Spread your fingers out. Why? Just do it. She huffs, but does as she's told. Finally. The skin of her fingertips has been cut by glass and wood, but the salve makes quick work of her injuries. The split nail is deeper and takes more time to knit together under the magic of the paste, and she hisses in pain. But soon enough, it's gone, leaving only rosy flesh and delicate white nails. I surrender her hands and she tests them with wide eyes. What is that stuff? Just a salve, I answer trying to ignore the fact that she is still sitting on my lap and hasn't thrown herself off of me yet. An uncomfortable twinge spurs that errant appendage between my thighs. My next words come harsher than I intend. Get off of me. I think I see an injured look pass over her face, but she obliges instantly, 
still teasing the nail that had been mended. Have you ever tried not being rude? No, I say simply. I don't have time for pleasantries. In truth, it is because I am used to my hounds. I never much bothered with the others in my cast and am glad to be dismissed as the kennel master and left to my own devices. The organ are good company. The rest are a nuisance. But not her, I find myself thinking. She's fascinating in her own way. I lower my gaze to the paperwork in front of me, so it doesn't stray to the human again. The document is sufficiently ruined, and I'll have to start over on the paperwork for breeder number seven. I pick up my quill in an attempt to salvage the mess. And yet, I'm not irritated like I thought I'd be. This human keeps me far too distracted for that. She's doing her best at maintaining the silence, but it's only a matter of time before she grows impatient again. From the corner of my eye, I can tell she's already going a handsome shade of red. It's endearing, and I wonder if all humans have that ability. Finally, I grace her with a look. What is wrong? Everything, she says immediately, lowering her gaze as if meeting my eye would be distasteful. I don't even know where we are. I cock my head and simply take her in. Tealith. She glances at me from under her lashes. You said that before. I did, I say, crumpling the ruined page and throwing it into the corner behind me, then pulling out a fresh sheet from a drawer. It is our city. Tealith, she repeats slowly, as if tasting the words. And is everyone like you? She must be talking about the troll vor she saw in the hallway. I let out a long sigh and surrender my work for another time. This human is the bravest of the lot, and I admit that I feel obligated to give her an explanation, though she'll never hear me say it. No. We demons come in many shapes and sizes. The ones you saw before are troll vor. They tend to guard the king and his assets, which is why they are stalking the halls near the cells. I pretend to lose interest, though I'm waiting for her to speak. Just as I anticipated, she does. What about you? My quill freezes over the fresh page. Is she so interested in me? I doubt it, but I amuse her anyhow. I'm a Volvath. We're fighters that leave the magic to the Sozgoroth, but we still have some chaotic energy inside of us. Her eyes widen at this tidbit of knowledge. That's what I've been feeling. I ignore her remark and freshen the tip of my quill. You said before that there are no humans here, right? I don't answer. Why? Is it so inaccessible? At that, I issue a shrug, falling too easily into conversation with her. I hate to admit that I rather enjoy this back and forth. She thinks I am more knowledgeable than I am. Only the Sazgaroth can transport anyone between here and the ground continents. Ground continents? It seems unconscious that she draws forward. What does that mean? Aren't all continents fastened to the earth? I finally rest all my attention on her. Not this one. This is the floating island of Glamoleth. Her expression changes to one of wonder. Tell me everything. Chapter 17. Cora. My mind goes blank at the words, and I stare at the demon in shock. Floating island. Those words separately make sense, but together, I can't understand them. Yes, he says with a boredom that I can't understand. I've witnessed a lot on Prothaka, all types of magic that my brain can't make sense of, but never have I seen a floating island, or even so much as a floating building. How powerful are these creatures to have an entire city above the planet? Laura's face flashes behind my eyes, and with this new information, this new impossibility of escape, I know that I need to help her. The only problem is, I know nothing of this city. I didn't even know that it isn't on Protheca. Rationally, I know that there is nothing I can do for her until I get more information. I wouldn't know where to look, and even if I found her, I wouldn't know where to run to escape. How do you leave an island that has no surroundings? There's no hope to disappear into the forest, no option to commandeer a boat. I can't even fathom how to start planning. 
so I push back my rising urgency to seek out my sister, and instead, try on something new. Compliance. My eyes size up the monster before me, and I consider my options. I could make a hasty escape and risk running into something much worse than him, or I could ask him to show me around and get a bearing on my surroundings. I suppress a grin as I size him up. He's definitely my best, considering he seems to be all bark and no bite. I'm almost shocked considering how brutal he was when he captured me compared to now. Maybe he won't hurt me too much because they need us for something. I can use that to my advantage. The only problem is, I doubt he's inclined to give me anything I want. I can be seen a little as a troublemaker, and considering he just had a blade pressed to my throat, we might be in rocky territory. In an effort to smooth things over, I offer him a small smile. I'm Cora. His eyes narrow slightly, and the air still feels charged between us as he tries to decide my motives. I can see it in the way he's evaluating me that he thinks I'm playing a game, but finally, begrudgingly, he grinds out, Giroth. In a small voice that doesn't feel entirely befitting of my defiant nature, I ask him, Do you think you could show me around the floating island? I try to bat my eyes at him, but he doesn't seem impressed. No. His voice is flat. I try again, keeping my tone gentle. Please. I just want to know where I am. He heaves a sigh. It's not a good idea. We're not used to having humans here. It won't be safe. Safe. There it is again. I shouldn't be hurt. It gives me a boost of confidence as I stick out my lower lip and pout. I'm not scared. I just want to look around. I really don't think. I'll behave. Giroth rubs at the back of his neck, and I can tell he's getting agitated. Fine, he grumbles, and I smile brightly. I need fresh air anyway. Just stay close to me and don't get in anyone's way. I am not in the mood to deal with any more crap today. I nod diligently, and he turns away from me, leading me out of the building. I'm not sure what I expected, but as the light hits us and my eyes adjust to being outside, my jaw drops open. The buildings shoot up into the sky, coming to multiple spires. Many of them twist as they reach toward the clouds, piercing them with three or four curved spikes that look like a torture device. They seem to be crafted out of black, shimmering stone, and I'm almost in trance staring up at the windowless buildings. Or maybe the panes are tinted so dark I just can't see them. Now that I can see clearly, I also realise that the entire island is shrouded in dark clouds. There is some light as the sun tries to fight through, but it's still dim, though not nearly as dark as the cells, and keeps a grey shadow cast about the city. My head is tilted back to take them, so much so that I'm not paying attention to where I'm walking. That's why I almost don't see the demon before me, before Giroth jerks me back. My eyes dart down to the demon I nearly ran straight into, and I jolt back as it turns to face me. It's massive, bigger even than Giroth. Actually, almost double his size. Wings that look like they'll stretch out to be twenty feet hand loosely from his body. I feel like I can't breathe as I take in the muscle corded around his body, no clothing on his upper half. A thick tail trails behind him, and it's covered in armour and spikes. I recognise it from my home, the one who destroyed all of the buildings with the fiery horns that are now smouldering. As he looks at me, I notice smoke start to rise from his horns, and it looks like there are embers flickering within them. Will they catch fire? Giroth pulls me back further, and the demon's eyes scan to him. New pet, Giroth. The king's request, actually. The demon grunts and then starts to walk away as I stare at it in wonderment. It's the thing of nightmares, of bedtime stories. It's a massive monster, and yet Giroth spoke to him as I would to any neighbour. What was that? I breathe. Oh, that's Astroth but he's a demon. Giroth nods. He's a Gilak. I turn to look at him and his much smaller, wingless frame. And you are? I've already forgotten the words. A Volvath. He doesn't seem to mind reminding me. I nod, trying to soak it in. Before I can say anything more, though, Giroth seems to hear something, his head whipping around. Shit, he mutters, pulling me off the path we had been walking on. I almost trip over the rough plants growing between the buildings. They're hard and thick, mostly black, but I spot some silver and gold peeking through. They don't look anything like what I've seen on Protheca. These almost look robotic, that's when I hear it. 
There's strong drums and the sound of stomping feet. My heart leaps in my throat, and I turn toward the sound. What is... My words trail off as a line of dark elves step into my view, pounding the drums. They are shackled and move in unison, marching forward. Behind them are more elves, heavy chairs weighing down their shoulders. I almost smile at seeing them treated the very way they treated me my whole life. This is matron processional, Giroth explains as the parade continues to move, a single file line of dark elves carrying a female demon on top of them, to celebrate them and honour the children they birth. The matrons all have lithe forms and thick flowing hair. They are scantily clothed. Their eyes seem to glow as they take us all in, and I wonder if they are assessing suitors. The one thing I notice about the crowd lining the pathway, besides the varying types of demons that makes me shrink into Giroth's shadow, is that there are no other humans. There's the dark elves and the demons, but I'm the only small creature here. I can feel panic rising up in me as a group of dancers pass through in the processional. They are dressed head to toe in black, their faces masked, and yet, their eyes look soulless. In fact, there isn't a demon here that I've seen any compassion from and I know that the Dark Elves aren't capable of it. With a city as different and as dangerous as this one, with no other humans, I wouldn't even know where I would start to look for Laura. Chapter 18 Giroth I watch with vague interest as the matron processional wraps up, but I notice out of the corner of my eye that Cora is soaking it all in. Her eyes are so wide, her skin a shade slightly paler as the demons start to filter back onto the pathway to go about their day. She doesn't seem to realize the way I'm watching her as she assesses everyone else, as I'm good at doing it without detection. I still don't understand why she wanted to come out here. She must know there is no escape. Her eyes don't go to the alleyways between buildings, though, like I expect. Instead, they size up the demons, tracking down their bodies like she's committing her comparisons to memory. She's calculating, and I find that I like that. I'm glad to be out here instead of locked up in my office. I hate doing the paperwork, and I especially need the distraction now that a problem has been brought to my attention. I can't fathom how a human woman got out of the cell and I understand even less where she would go. I refuse to ask Cora, because she most likely won't tell me, and I don't want her to know that's what my mind is on. Instead, I lead her through the city as she asked. Her mind is heavily preoccupied, so she doesn't ask me any more questions or pester me as she did before. Maybe this arrangement was a good idea. Now you've seen other types of demons and witnessed our daily processional. Do you have any requests? She blinks up at me, looking shaken. I'm sure it's a lot to take in, and her head snaps back as a crackle of thunder erupts from the sky. Does that strike the ground? I shrug. It doesn't give us any trouble. Lightning flashes through the clouds, and her eyes dart around like she's afraid of being out in the open. Don't worry. It only makes us stronger. Her skin seems to pale at that, and I almost feel bad. I'm not trying to frighten her. I thought she'd be happy that I am finally answering her questions. I clear my throat. I can show you some of my favorite places, I suggest, though I regret the words immediately. Why would I say that? The tension in her shoulders eases a little as she turns to me. I'd like that. We follow the winding path to the city center until we reach the fountains. They are ornate, laid out in a diamond-shaped pattern, with seats weaving in between them. They look fantastic during a thunderstorm. Is that blood? She gasps, and I sputter a laugh. No, I cough out. The water is naturally that tint since we don't filter it out. I wouldn't drink from the fountains, but the red comes from the stones on the bottom of our streams, not blood. She swipes her forehead. Phew. I was a little worried you were going to sacrifice me. It takes a second for me to realize that she was only joking, and I chuckle a little. No, not today at least. This time I get a grin. We walk among the gardens before we continue our tour, winding down toward the north side of the city. 
The Demon King's house is easy to spot from the city center, as it is up on a hill and enormous. I've never understood the need for so much space, but I do not concern myself with it. The only reason I want to come this way is to show Korra the gardens. There are small plants scattered throughout the city, but here, they thrive. This is the king's garden, I tell her, stopping before the fence. The king lives here, she whispers. I turn to her, curious why she suddenly looks so nervous. Yes. She nods, her eyes roaming over the vast vegetation. The walkways are lined with shimmering black stones that complement the bushes and broadleaf trees that line the path. Silver vines twist up the tree trunks, reflecting back the flashes of lightning. It's beautiful, and yet, Cora says nothing. In fact, her eyes don't even look like they are seeing it. I'm not sure why, but I'm worried that I've spooked her somehow. She's grown quiet, withdrawn, and I've learned that that is not her personality. No, she's more like an unyielding Urgen pup who refuses to listen. I should find it aggravating that she is bold enough to bite me and throw chair legs at me. But instead, I find it admirable for her to be so courageous. She's defiant and she doesn't let fear rule her. Even out here in the city, she doesn't cower. She's kept a healthy distance between her and potential threats, showing her intelligence and trying to allow for her to be able to calculate her next move but she hasn't let any concern show through. It's good that she won't show weakness. I find that her fearlessness makes me more interested in her, and I try to talk to her, wishing she'd come out of her shell again. I was starting to enjoy her company, to my surprise, as we teased each other and showed her around. I thought she was feeling the same before I mentioned the king. My heart throbs a little as I look over at her. I hate to see something bothering her especially if I somehow unknowingly caused it. I want to bring back that smile to her lips again. Her rosy lips that stretch into the most radiant grin I've ever seen. Cora turns to me then, and I almost jolt out of my skin. Where was that thought going? Can she see it on my face? I almost feel a little nervous as she looks at me, until I see her eyes are still slightly unfocused. She's not concerned with me. At least I didn't think she was until she steps closer tilting her head back to stare deeply in my eyes. My breath catches in my throat from the intensity of my gaze, and I chastise myself for losing control over myself around this human. I need to get a grip. What are you going to do to us? Cora asks, and her voice is so soft and broken that I almost crumble right there. Since I've met her, I've never seen defeat in her, but it's dancing in her eyes. The not knowing, the new place, the missing person. It's enough to destroy anyone, and it seems to be taking a toll on her. My brain stalls as her words echo around my mind. I don't know how to answer her. A part of me flares up with annoyance. We were having such a great time out here in the city. Her questions finally stemmed, and now she had to bring this up. She's lucky she got out of that cage, that no one else decided to deal with her before me. She should be thanking her gods that she isn't dead right now. Instead, she's pestering me instead of appreciating the advanced society I've shown her here on Tylith. I'm not even sure if she's been taking it in with how quiet she's been. And I frown deeply at that. Then, a thought occurs to me. And I can feel my lips curl up without my permission. I can't help it. There's only one thing in all of this world that I allow myself to care for so deeply and enjoy. Well... It's actually the only thing I genuinely enjoy, because I don't like to be around others. They suck. She pales a little as I grin, probably assuming the worst of me or the plans that everyone has for her. She looks as though she's going to ask another question before I answer her first, which I have no intention of doing. I don't let it deter me as I tell her. I have one more thing to show you. Chapter 19. Cora. I'm not blind to the way that Jirath dodges my questions, but I can't be on his bad side. If he has something that he wants to show me instead of answering me, then I'm just going to have to tough it out. 
It's not that I'm truly bothered by the way he ignores me. He literally kidnapped me from my home, so why would I expect him to be polite or cooperative? Honestly, I'm surprised by how nice he's been so far. What bothers me is that I can tell he's doing so to hide something. I fight back a shiver as I consider what it could be. What's worse than being dragged here and imprisoned? My stomach twists violently as I chew it over, but it's not worth tormenting my mind. I know that of all the horror I've seen, all the things my mind could conjure, the reality could be so much worse. Instead, I see how excited he looks and decide to swallow down my growing frustration. I didn't know that demons could look so thrilled, but Giroth's eyes are wide, his lips turned up into a bright smile, and I wonder when's the last time I've seen anyone look like that, human or otherwise. Lead the way, I sigh. His smile grows wider, and he reaches out to grab my hand. I let him, surprised that although it is bony, he feels strong and soft somehow. I don't recoil from it the way I had before. He leads me through the city, but instead of diving deep into it as we had before, he skirts around buildings and takes the alleyways. He's slipping out to the edge of the bustling crowds, and we finally break through a set of buildings to find one lone, stout structure. It almost looks like a warehouse to me, and if I were just passing by, I would have assumed it to be as such. As Giroth pulls me toward it, though, I realise that there's a flow of energy pouring out of it. It's ghastly, the danger that seems to be emanating from the building, and my body is screaming at me to run. As we approach, I realise that part of that low thrum that I thought was in my head is a deep, harmonious growl. I tense, terrified of what lies within, and I look to Giroth in shock. Is he about to feed me to some monster? Does he take delight in that? He doesn't even seem to notice my growing hesitation as he drops my hand and pushes open the door. Immediately the harsh growl ceases and the air is pierced with frenzied whining. It doesn't sound like whatever is in there is pained, so I creep closer, seeing the inside is illuminated well for me to take in whatever creature Giroth wants to show me. My sweet babies, he coos, his voice going up in pitch. Are you hungry? Oh, I bet you are. I almost laugh as I creep closer to the building. You deserve a treat, my good elf eaters. Do you want a treat? There's barking and yips of excitement, and it strikes me suddenly. Does this demon have a soft spot for dogs? Feeling much less weary, I step into the doorway and freeze immediately. While they sounded like dogs outside, the only thing that makes them remotely resemble the pets on the ground is how they are on all fours and covered in fur. My heart leaps to my throat as the ones closest to me bark and howl. I can see several with three rows of razor-sharp teeth. Another handful have barbed tails, two or three per dog, that wag excitedly as Giroth reappears into my view. He holds a bucket and I can't tell what's in it, but the creatures are overwhelmed with excitement. The ones who had their eyes trained on me immediately turn back toward their owner. He grins at them and they leap over one another, trying to get at him. Their whole bodies vibrate as their excitement grows, greeting him by wagging their entire bodies. They really are just puppies, gnashing at each other to get to him. He chuckles, and it catches me off guard. I haven't heard him do that yet. The sound is almost melodic, even though it's deep and throaty. It reminds me of these soothing songs that I've heard men hum and sing as they work, their voices low and keeping a steady rhythm. I didn't forget about you, he tells them crossing the room to pet them on top of their heads. No, his voice starts to increase in pitch again. No, I would never, never ever forget about my precious beasts. They lap at his hands, five of them descending on him at once. I notice some of the dogs even have two heads, and one of them stands on top of the other's back to lick his face. Oh, did you miss me? I missed you. I press my hand to my mouth to hold back my smile as he continues to praise his pets. As ferocious as they look, with their sharp claws and red eyes, they are nothing more than loving animals. I see the same change in Giroth. He may have been kinder to me as he showed me the city than he was during our chase, but I would say that he was only putting up with my presence. Here I see true happiness colour his face and fill his eyes. It suits him. He turns around and he almost looks surprised, like he forgot I was there. Come in, they won't hurt you, I swear. Though my body says differently, I believe him. I doubt these animals would ever disobey him. I walk farther into the building, pausing in front of one of the pens closest to the door. Are these your pets? I ask hesitantly. 
These are my pride and joy, he affirms. They are prized Urgin hounds. Hunting dogs? I venture. They are excellent at that. I've never met another beast with such wicked tempers and a pension for destruction. I gulp, and he quickly adds, They are calm around me, though. Come, I want you to meet them. He swipes the bucket, dipping his hand in and pulling out a grotesque lump of shredded red meat and tendon. The dogs howl excitedly, but he holds it out to me. I wrinkle my nose as I stare down at his hand. What do I do with that? Help me feed them. He drops the bucket and grabs one of my hands, slopping the meat into my palm. I force back a gag as he scoops up his own shredded meat. This is Genel, he says, as he offers the treat to a dog with two heads. Aralath, he gestures to one with spiked horns like his. Ogdrech, it has spiked sides. Elsroth is one of my gentlest. Give her some of yours, he insists. I hold out my hand to the beast, and she licks at my skin gently, nipping to take the meat with her. Even though I can see her three rows of deadly teeth, and her claws as thick and sharp as knives, she is careful with me. See, they aren't mean creatures. They're just misunderstood. Deep down they are sweethearts, even if they look scary. His eyes are trained on the dogs, but I'm staring right at him. Coming here has shown him to me in a whole new light, and I see now that despite his kidnapping of me, he is still kind, far kinder than the dark elves and even some humans. Yes, I murmur back to him as he feeds the dogs another piece of meat. Sometimes people forget to look past appearances and see what is on the inside. Exactly, he answers, though I doubt we are talking about the same thing. Chapter 20 Giroth I'm funneling the dogs back inside when I feel Cora's hand brush the underside of my wrist. I click the lock in place of the pen I'm standing in front of before turning to look at her. Some of the hounds are still rushing around us, excited but exhausted from their run. I'd let them loose outside to show her their skills, pride busting through me. I haven't managed to put them all back yet and I throw my hand out to command them to stop jumping on me. Her blue eyes sparkle in the light pouring in, and in them I see a certain sadness that I've been trying to ignore. Her eyebrows pinch together as I stare at her, her lips parting slightly. I know she's going to ask me another question I either can't or won't answer. Why can't she just stop with all of it and enjoy some time with my beasts? Please let us go, she breathes and my mouth pulls down in a frown for the first time since I brought her here. I suck in a deep breath and move to turn away, but she darts forward, grabbing me and this time not letting go. Please, Giroth, I'm begging you. Her eyes are pleading as she searches mine. Please. I stiffen, clenching my jaw. Her voice is so soft and sweet, even as it trembles a little, and I hate the way that it makes my body react. My heart constricts as I take her in, and I open my mouth to respond. The problem is, I can't. I can't let her go. I can't help her. So I clamp my mouth shut instead. I should just be honest with her. Tell her that there's no way for me to let her go. That I couldn't set her free even if I wanted to. Which I refuse to admit that I do. No. I'm too afraid to see her heart break plainly on her face when I tell her that she is a prisoner here with no other option. Instead, I turn away. I almost scoff at the thought as it runs through my mind. I am a demon. I should not be afraid of anyone or anything. Others fear me. I am of the stories of nightmares, my beasts whispered about by only the bravest. There is no reason that a human should render me speechless. I spin toward her with newfound resolve, but before I can tell her the truth, I see the sadness has only deepened. Her shoulders are curved under the weight of it, and it strikes me deep to my core to see her like that. Clearing my throat, I try to smother my guilt and shame. I know I can't tell her the truth, so instead I ask her, Why do you want to go back to your elvish masters? The raw emotion on her face captivates me as she answers, like any slave, I want to be free. 
My heart aches from the pain tremble in her voice and the crease between her brows. I feel like her pain echoes within me, and it destroys my resolve. My mouth runs dry, and the only thing I can force out is... Give me one second. I busy myself with putting the rest of the hounds away. They whimper and yip in protest, and I toss treats inside the pens to appease them. I needed to break away from her stare before I took her out of here and tried to save her myself. I curse myself for caring so much. I don't understand how this human has such a hold on me, but she does. It makes it hard for me to wipe the erratic thoughts from my brain as I finish up my work and turn to find her fidgeting close to the door. With a sigh, I cross the room, motioning for my pups to fall silent instead of the excited howls as I move in their direction. Thankfully, they do as I ask, and I stop just in front of Cora. I haven't answered your questions today, I start, feeling my stomach tighten as her eyes lift to mine. I feel you deserve to know the truth of your fate. I swallow the lump forming in my throat as a shadow of fear passes over her face. I was sent on a mission by the Demon King to obtain human women. He has plans that involve you and those we brought with you. I feel it's important that she knows I want no part of this. My only role was to bring you here. I was not supposed to let you out of that cell, and I certainly had no choice when it came to my involvement in the mission. The Demon King doesn't leave much room for choice. Her voice is little more than a whisper like mine as she asks, What kind of plans? I'm not sure where to look. I don't think I can take seeing the panic and fear that I know will flood her once I tell her the truth. It will stop me, that much I'm sure of. Instead, I look just over her head at my newest mother and her pups, drawing strength from my beloved pets. They're the only goodness I've known, and I rely on them to get me through this life. He intends to see if you can carry demon children. The silence between us is stifling. It feels so thick that I think I could cut through it. Against my better judgment, my eyes cut down to survey Cora's reaction. Just as I feared, her face has gone deathly white, her fists balled up so tight I worry she's going to dislocate something. Cora! I start, stepping toward her, but she jolts back. What do you mean, carry demon children? I sigh, and this time I hold her gaze as I answer. Our race is dying out. Our matrons are so rare and produce so few offspring that we will go extinct if we do not find some other means of reproduction. Her eyes widen and I don't see any point in stopping now. We need breeders or we won't survive, and so our only option seems to be humans. What about the elves? She gasps out, her chest rising and falling rapidly. Her eyes dart around with that panic I wanted to avoid. I've seen them here. Use them. I wrinkle my nose in disgust, though I do anything to get rid of the terror etched in her features. Dark elves are a foul race. We do not want to sully our blood by mixing it with theirs. She's gasping now and I ache to calm her. I don't know what else to do as I watch her. She's stuttering, trying to find something to say. And I don't know why I even try to bother. Dark elves are poor stock anyway. It's hard for them to conceive and harder for them to carry. I say as if it's assuring. Humans have been able to carry half-breeds throughout Protheca, and we are sure that you will survive the pairing. I want it to come across like a compliment and hopeful, like she just needs to pop out a few kids and she'll be fine. I know it's more than that. I don't know what kind of way she'll be forced to conceive, in what manner she will give birth, or with what type of demon. It could very likely tear her apart, even if we have seen that there are half-human, half-dark elf kids on the ground. If their bodies can survive those monsters, they should be fine with us. Cora doesn't see it as the positive I try to present it as, and she starts to tremble, her eyes growing enormous as she withdraws inside of herself. I hate the way it hurts me, and even more, I hate that I can do nothing to fix it. Chapter 21. Cora. My heart thunders in my chest, and my blood pounds so loud in my ears that I almost can't hear Giroth's words. I almost wish I hadn't. Panic grips me tightly, 
and I don't know how to swallow it down as horrific images roll through my mind. The idea of that massive firehorn demon dragging me to bed flashed behind my eyes. Then it turned into a slideshow of all the prospects I saw on the street today. I doubt any of them will be gentle, and I squirm a little at the difference in my size compared to all them. I don't want to even imagine what it will be like, especially if I do conceive. Then, a war starts to wage in my mind over what is worse. To conceive and hope it doesn't kill me, or for the pairing to be incompatible and hope the demons don't kill me. I'm not sure, but either way, I don't think I'll live. My mind is racing as I think about the possibility of a horned newborn ripping its way out of me. I'm trembling, the prospect too much for me, and I want nothing more than to be back home. At least there, I knew my way around. I could disappear into the forest if I needed to, and although the dark elves were cruel and clearly wanted something from me, I wasn't abducted just to be impregnated. Another shudder flows through me. I always thought if I were to have a child, it would be with someone I care about. Sex may not be sacred on Pratheka, but having children isn't usually a concern. It's always been a little bit of a relief that the Dark Elves seem to have a hard time conceiving, with each other and with us. Or maybe they feed us something to keep us sterile, and we don't even know it. My head is a thundering mess, and there's a low hum in my ears that seems to block out all other sound. There are so many ways for this to go wrong, but I can't think of a single way that makes it right. There's no escaping it, no option for me, and while I've always been a little fearless and reckless, I've always had the opportunity to be. What do I do when my only option is death? I don't realise that the noise I'm hearing is not in my head until Giroth throws his hand out. That's when it clicks for me that it's his hounds that are growling, the sound low and deep and echoing throughout the kennel. To my surprise, they don't fall silent. My emotions seem to be taking a toll on them, and as my thoughts grow, so do their protests. Their growls turn to snarls and barks, their teeth exposed and their bodies tensing. They seem ready to rip me apart. They transform from the gentle creatures he showed me into the fearsome ones they were bred to be. I can feel all the chaotic energy rolling off of them as they leap at the walls separating me from them, clawing at them with their dagger-like nails. There's worry in Giroth's eyes, and I fear that his hounds are going to attack me. I'm already so wound up and afraid that when he turns his back to silence the dogs, using his stern voice that's still softer than the one he used with me when he had a blade pressed to my throat, I bolt. Find a way out, I murmur, urging my legs faster. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I know that this is unreasonable. I have no idea where I'm going, and if I get caught, I could end with a worse fate than the other two I've imagined. Still, terror grips me tightly and I can't think straight. The only thought bounding around my mind is to find a way out. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I know that there must be a way. But my mind keeps halting, as I remember this is a floating island inhabited by demons. That doesn't slow my feet as I tear through the sidewalks, trying to avoid going back into the city. I'm terrified to run into other demons, and as I see some walk past, few even turning to look at me, bile starts to rise up in the back of my throat. There's one in particular, Another Volvath that's taller and thinner than Giroth. His eyes are burning a bright red against his black skin, and the thin horns on top of his head look deadly, like weapons themselves. His eyes track my movements and my chest tightens with fear. This is what I was afraid of. This is why I am running. I hate the way he's surveying my body, like I am his for the taking. The idea of his fingers raking over my body triggers my gag reflex, but I force myself not to slow. Instead, I swerve down a side alleyway, and I'm relieved when he doesn't follow me. Oh shit, I mutter as I stumble out before another Gilak. He's huge, hulking over the other demons and dark elves near him. He turns to look at me, and those horns start to crackle with a fire as he steps toward me. Biting back a shout, I take off in the opposite direction. I can still hear the crunch of feet behind me, though the weight sounds much too light to be the Gilak I saw before. Still, I can't take my chances. As if to propel me forward, my body conjures images of what could happen if he were to catch me. In my mind's eye view, I see him snatching me up, taking me back to his place and forcing himself on me. I am so small compared to him that I fear I will break. I doubt I could survive the coupling, forget about the pregnancy. I can do this, I whisper encouragement to myself as my body tries to fail me. Whoever is behind me seems to be growing closer, and I don't dare to look back. 
I'm afraid I'll stumble or run into something, and I won't risk giving them a few extra seconds to get to me. My lungs are on fire, and my entire torso burns with the exertion, but I refuse to slow down. They made a mistake when they took me. I never go quietly. I never just comply. I tried to, but now that I see it would all be in vain, there's no reason to. No, I'm a fighter, and if the demon gaining on me wants me, he's going to have to try a little harder. I feel a manic grin spread across my face as I dart around a corner and see a narrow alleyway between two buildings. Found it, I say aloud, not caring if my pursuer hears me. If I can make it through there, I'd stand a chance to slip out of sight. It's the only option I have right now. I dig my heels into the ground, propelling me forward, and I practically fling myself through the air, pivoting in preparation to turn around the next corner. Except, my feet don't land. I blink, gasping out a soft, What? I expect them to hit the ground, and that's when my actions catch up with my brain. It feels almost unreal how slow my fall is, and my mind doesn't seem to process that I've reached the edge of the floating island without realising it. My head swivels around, taking in the vast expanse of the sky, the grey clouds that shroud out the sunlight even here. The air tears at my hair as my descent starts, and I know I should feel worried or afraid, or at least an adrenaline boost from falling. But I don't. I'm not sure if I just used all my emotions up, but I feel almost peaceful when I, at least, see no more demons. I'm not ready to die, that much is for sure, but if that is my fate, then I'd rather it be on my own terms. Chapter 22 Giroth I'm able to gain on Korra as she stumbles at the sight of Gilak, but I'm not fast enough to close the distance just yet. She got a pretty big head start with my back turned to her, and her small form makes it easy for her to slip through the crowded pathways. My heart thunders as she turns a corner, and I see where she is headed. I want to shout at her to stop, but I doubt she will listen to me. Instead, I pound my feet against the ground harder, and when she darts between the two buildings on the edge of the island, I leap forward. I gasp out in relief as my arm circles around her waist, yanking her back. My stomach is pressed to the ground, my body in the prone position to support our weight. If I had been even a second later, I wouldn't have caught her before she was out of my reach. I'm surprised my arms aren't trembling from the rush of adrenaline pounding through me as I pull Cora back up. A part of my mind wants to chastise her. How stupid is she to leap to her death like that? No demon would have jumped straight off the edge. She knows she is on a floating island, and yet she ran through the roads on the edge of the city with reckless abandon. The thought fills me with the same rage and panic that had been flooding me as I chased her, but I hold my tongue. It's clear that she's not thinking straight. I know she is terrified, and although I don't feel that is a good reason to attempt a 10,000-foot jump to her death, I understand that she wasn't in the right headspace to make sense of where she was. As I pull us away from the edge, relief floods through me. I had never felt such intense fear as when she took off, and while it doesn't make much sense to me, I'm not going to dissect it right now. All I know is that it is a relief to have her in my arms. I try not to think too much as I pull her closer to my body, needing more of her. Sitting still lets my emotions crush down on me, and I don't understand half of what's hitting me. Never have I been concerned for anyone or anything but my organ pups. Pulling Cora against me, though, feels much like holding a newborn hound, my heart filled with the need to protect her. I can't fathom what would have happened if I hadn't been in time to save her. And I don't mean my repercussions from the Demon King. I run my fingers through her long hair as both of our breathing slows, shifting her up so that she sits perpendicular in my lap. I brush my hand down her back, and a part of me excites when she doesn't pull away from my touch immediately. Cora, I murmur to her, and she tips her head back to stare at me with those icy blue eyes. You can't run away like that. You don't know where you are. She nods, biting her trembling lip. I know. I sigh, tapping her chin lightly. There are much worse things on this island than me, and I don't want you to get hurt. 
I wince internally at the admission, but plow forward. You have to stay by my side or something might happen to you. Her gaze drops, and I let it, pressing her firmly against my chest. It's the only place I want her right now after she just scared me, and I wrap my arms tightly around her small frame. Listen, I can protect you. I will gain the Demon King's favor with my work, so as long as you stay by me, you'll be safe from others. She doesn't answer, and I'm not sure why I keep talking. It sounds like I'm asking her to choose me, when in reality she has no other option. I'm not even sure I can get the Demon's King ear as I promise it. I want to keep you safe, but you have to let me. I'm not sure if she's listening to me anymore as I rock her gently back and forth. I want to soothe her ragged nerves, and this just feels right. Or it did until I hear her mumble. I don't want to be a slave. I know, I coo, but she shakes her head at me. You don't know. She's starting to sound hysterical again. You brought me here and I can't leave. I'm forced to be a slave for the Dark Elves, for demons. I just want to be free. She pounds lightly at my chest as if she's trying to push me away, and I let my arms go slack but still rest around her. She's obviously not trying to get away from me. It's more about venting her frustrations, it seems. I let her beat against me until she seems to wear herself out. She keeps muttering about how she misses the forest, misses having some semblance of freedom. I want to give it to her, but I have no way to. Finally, her words are overtaken with tears, and sobs choke off her next sentence. I tighten my arms around her, pulling her against me again, and Cora lets me. She cries against my body her small frame shaking, and I try to help her. I've never been one to soothe others, though, so I mostly just rock her and stroke her hair. I have no words for this situation. I'm sorry feels useless, and I have no true option to offer her. I'm sure it is miserable not being in control of her life. Guilt bubbles up in me until it rages against my relief. It makes me feel sick, knowing that I did this to her. I try to calm my mind by reminding myself that if it wasn't me, it would have been someone else, but that doesn't help. I'm glad she's in my care because I would trust her with no one else, but I do wish she were with me willingly. I wish our day could have been just a stroll around the city instead of her observing her new surroundings as she looked for an escape, but that's not the roles we were given to play. It breaks my heart knowing that this is how it is. I'm a demon, her captor, her oppressor, but I want her to see me as more. It's a shocking realization, but it's what feels right. I want her to know that I don't have to be those things to her, that I do have the king's favor. Maybe there is something I can do for her somehow. I can't set her free, but I may be able to think of something to help her, because I would do anything to ease the pain that I can so clearly hear in her cries. It shatters me, and I'm worried that I will do something rash as I let my thoughts get away from me. I have to remind myself that she is here for a purpose, and while that causes a resurgence of guilt, it also forces me to remember that the fantasies in my head are just that. I swallow hard and force myself to accept that the plans for her will not align with me. I try to soothe the aching pain inside with the reminder that she will be here on Tealith, though, and I can keep her in my life no matter what. If only I could take her pain away, too. As awful as I feel inside, Racked with guilt and panic and sadness at our prospects, I'm sure it is nothing compared to what Cora is going through. I want to ease her burdens, shoulder it as my own, and I know now in this moment that I am screwed, because I am willing to do just about anything to bring back that adventurous, courageous woman I met. Chapter 23. Cora. All my strength has evaporated. Giroth's arms are a comfort, despite the chaos roiling beneath his skin. I let my head rest on his shoulder and finally give in to him. I'm tired of fighting. His mouth is to my ear as he stands with me in his arms. I'm taking you home. Home, I think, a miserable smile finding me. My home was destroyed along with any life I might have had down on Protheca. It wasn't much but we were making the best of it. Now my siblings are all alone down there, at the mercy of the Dark Elves. 
and Laura. More tears come, and I sob against Giroth, linking my arms around his strong neck. He has no trouble carrying me, a hand pressed to my back as if to protect me from the other inhabitants of Tilith. For as gruff as he pretends to be, there's something gentle about him that he doesn't want anyone to see. But I see it anyway. It was there the first time we crossed paths in the settlement, and again, when he showed me all the strange and incredible things of his world, things that no other human has ever laid eyes on. He was honest with me in the kennels, when he could have told me anything. And even as I was overcome with fear, he protected and consoled me. I don't expect the other residents of Talith would have been so patient. These are the things that replay in my mind until exhaustion overcomes me, and I fall fast into unconsciousness. When I wake, it is sudden and gasping, but I am in a warm bed that is far too large for me, of the likes I've never felt before. He's seated in a chair beside me, drawing forward to lay me back down. You're safe, he assures me, pulling the covers up to my neck. Just rest. I watch his stern face. Where am I? My home, he answers patiently, that troubled expression never leaving him. Are you hungry or thirsty? You've been asleep for some time. My gut churns, and I don't know if I could keep anything down, in my miserable state. But I nod anyway. Something to drink would be nice, I murmur, enjoying the warmth of his hand encompassing my cheek. A claw traces my jaw endearingly. Then you will have it. He snaps his fingers, and dark elves I didn't notice before break away from the wall and disappear through a doorway. Their existence in this place is so sudden to me that I can't help but be surprised and a little horrified. Giroth is quick to notice. Don't worry, they are loyal to their master. Still, I glanced at where they had vanished. Aren't you worried they might... No, he assures me, as if he already knows what I mean to say. They have no memory of their lives on Protheca, and the chaos on Tilith prevents them from using magic. They are, as one might say, neutered. I relax into the mattress my trouble's a little lighter. That's good. Giroth leans in as if to kiss my crown, hesitating, then saying, You're safe under my roof, Cora. I promise you that. He draws away before his lips brush my forehead to stand at his full height, staring down at me as I'm a puzzle to solve. Rest now. Wait, I murmur, stopping him in his tracks. Please tell me. His expression is neutral. Yes? What happened to Laura? The question is heavy. What's become of my sister? Nothing changes in his pale eyes. I don't know. That's what I'm trying to find out. Later. Giroth is an attentive guardian, spending all his spare time dedicated to my well-being. He still has to care for his Urgen monsters and is responsible for the other women who he has assured me are being better kept than when we first arrived. I believe him, not because I want to, but because he has given me no reason to doubt him. On that first day, he put me in his bed, and when I finally found out, I felt awful for displacing him. I insisted that he sleeps beside me. It is the least I could do after everything he's done for me. The first few nights, he gently rejected my offer and slept in the chair. But as we have gotten closer, he surrendered to my insistence, and now he sleeps beside me. Every day, I wake to his handsome face, made gentle by rest. This morning is no different. I dare to touch his hollow cheek. I wonder what the future holds for me. He cannot keep me forever, surely. And when his work is finished, I will be given to the king with the others. It's a frightening prospect, but neither of us have any say in the matter. I wonder what it would be like to belong to Giroth instead. I feel safe in his arms, and know he'd handle me with care. It is in that rare smile he shows no one else and the way he caresses me without the bite of his sharp claws. I dare run my fingers over his tunic to feel his heat beneath. He stirs slightly, and his eyes slide open. You're awake. I don't say anything, chasing that hard line of his abs and making his stomach leap. Giroth catches my hand in a firm grip. You don't know what you're doing. I do, actually, I whisper, certain that he feels it too. Check out the uncut version on Kindle Unlimited.
Chapter 24 Girath. My eyes opened gradually, the slight weight on my chest a reminder of what happened last. I glanced down at Cora's sleeping face, obscured by her tangled golden hair. When I draw it away, there's a smile playing about her lips. I can't help but smile in turn, pressing my nose to her crown and taking in her scent. It mingles with mine, so that I know I have ruined her for the king's experiment. But I cannot bring myself to feel guilty when we did nothing wrong. I'm just glad she survived our pairing. She was silent and insistent, as if she understood the implications of what we did. I'd expect nothing less from her. My mind strays to my duties and the other women who still tremble in fear at the sight of me. Their paperwork is concluded, and today is the day I must deliver them to the king. My full heart sinks as I readjust Cora in the bed and slip free of her sweet embrace. She'll be safe here while I meet with the king. I dress slowly, considering what I might say. I've had no luck in discovering the whereabouts of Cora's sister, and I will have to answer for that. He may punish me for my oversight, and I will accept it with grace. It feels as much as my own castigation as that of the women I've tirelessly recorded these past few days. I just hope I'm allowed to return to Cora to explain before any sentence is carried out. On my way out the door, I call on my dark elf slaves. Make sure she has everything she needs, I tell them, scouring their neutral expressions and dull, violet eyes. And remain scarce. She is not fond of your kind. They dip their heads in unison. Yes, master. Satisfied, I take my leave and head to the cell blocks. There, the women are huddled in a tight circle, whispering to one another, as if they have secrets we care about. The Trollvor guards let me through into the borrowed storeroom that has become something akin to a bunker for the humans. One sees me, then the rest follow her gaze, and they all go silent. I maintain a dour expression. Stand up, I order, leaving no room for questions. But they are not like Cora and they do so without hesitation. A few begin to weep again as I number them. Twenty-one, I count, satisfied that no more have gone missing in my absence. This way, I say, putting my hand out to the only exit behind me. Behave, and there will be no need to bind you in irons again. The carriage is already waiting for us. They file in, chittering and lamenting their circumstance under their breath. Some are taken aback by the ever-present storm rolling above the island. Others blubber when they see a stray geelock lumbering through the courtyard. They all reek of fear, and would be torn apart by my organ if my hound so much as got a whiff of it. I'll have to bathe before I tend to them. The journey is brief and uneventful, hardly a stone's throw from the cells. Soon enough, we've arrived at the royal estate that overshadows everything. Trollvor guards line the halls, which the women shuffle through in utter silence. It's as if a spell has been cast over them, and they don't dare to utter a peep until we arrive at the throne room. There, several of them muffle sounds of shock at the sight of the demon king, Asmodeus. They huddle together like the flustered birds that they are. I issue a formal bow. My king, as you requested. He leans forward in his throne, looking over the crowd of human women that shrink from his attention. Well done, Giroth, he says, filling me with an uncomfortable sort of pleasure. Before, I might have basked in it. But now that I have fallen for a human woman, it prickles under my skin like a curse. I hate that he chose me for this task, and still, I'm glad to have known her in this brief passage of time. Too brief, I think. We have only just met, and yet our time is running short. He continues, and I can sense his favor beaming down on me from beneath that dark hood that conceals his features. I knew I could trust you with this task. Thank you, my king. The Trollvor close in on the women, who become agitated with fear and upset. But the king's focus does not stray from me. Something is troubling you. Speak. I watch as the women are led away. Several shoot me accusing stares as if I am responsible for what will happen to them. I'm almost glad when they are out of sight, the weight of my shame lessening. 
It is. I trail off, chewing on my lip as I consider how to voice my concerns. When I first arrived with the women in Tylith, one of them went missing. I pause, gauging his response and finding nothing. So, I continue. I have been searching for any sign of the culprit, but have come up empty. It is a failure of duty, my king. I should have noticed sooner. He seems to consider my words. And what of the other missing human? My heart stalls briefly, but I keep my expression neutral. My king? There were twenty-three documents, and you have delivered twenty-one. If one is missing, then there is another that has been unaccounted for as well. Heat crawls over my flesh, and I realize he's talking about Korra. For the first time since the king has graced me with his presence, true guilt washes over me. He already knows, as he seems privy to everything that transpires in Tilith. My apologies, I begin, bowing a little deeper. I have kept that one in my residence because she attempted to jump off the island after escaping. I wanted to keep a closer eye on her for her own safety. I think I might have made a grave miscalculation as King Asmodeus goes deadly silent. Then, his form begins to shake with grating laughter. It fills the hall and echoes from the high ceiling, and relief washes over me. I cannot know my king's designs, but I am certain he is not cross with me. When he finally settles, he stands from his throne. He is taller than even I am, and I cannot help but be humbled in his presence. Do not fear my wrath, Giroth. I was right to have chosen you for this task. It was a delicate mission, and you have exceeded my expectations. He descends the dais, his heavy plate armor rattling with each step. Because of your efforts, our race will not be snuffed out on this hostile alien planet. Carry yourself with pride, Kennelmaster, because you bear the gratitude of your king and the charge of a generation. How I want his words to fill me with pride. They should. Instead, a deep self-loathing nearly bowls me over, and I am trapped between the snare of duty and the pull of my errant heart. Chapter 25. Cora. For the first time in days I wake up alone in his room. I think I still feel Giroth's heat in the depression of the mattress next to me, but it evaporates upon contact with my searching fingers. A great weight bears down on me, and I curl up into a tight ball in an attempt to preserve our shared warmth. I can't get his scent out of my nose. After our unexpected tryst, nothing feels the same. I had acted out of desperation, but there was something so right about what we did, and I can't stop thinking about him. I had imagined sex with a demon would be a dreadful affair, but it seems that we are compatible after all. My hand drops between my thighs, to the cleft, which is still raw after taking so much of him, but even my nub is swollen and impatient for more. Where is he? I throw my face to the ceiling, groaning in frustration. I don't know the ways of demons. I risked everything to give myself to him but he may not see it in the same light. Perhaps it was just a transaction for him, and despite everything we've experienced together, he'll give me to his king when the time comes. I can't blame him. He is a servant to his master, and I know that if I try to reason him out of it, it will only get him in trouble. I don't want him to be punished for my actions, nor put himself in harm's way for my sake. I just hope I'll see my sister again before I'm given away to be bred. I close my eyes at the thought. The other demons won't be so gentle. I can't hold back a shiver. If I had a choice. But I am not one to be given a choice in Tilith. They see me as little more than a vessel for their offspring. Not Giroth, though. If our coupling was any indicator, he is a cautious creature, ever vigilant. A singular specimen among his kind. At first he put a blade to my neck in an effort to master me. But now, the simple memory of his kiss makes me crave his sharp tongue. I haven't experienced nearly enough of him, and I need more time before duty calls him to surrender me. It's all I'm allowed to hope for. The door creaks on its hinges. For a brief moment, I think it might be Giroth, and sit up. But his dark elf servants make an appearance instead, and I gather the blanket over my chest as they enter. With them, they've brought a rolling cart with several trays laden upon it. Breakfast is served, one of them says. 
As they lay out the spread on the side table, I get a better chance to look at them. They seem bland here compared to their Protheca counterparts, as if all the colour has been washed out of their midnight flesh. And their eyes are dull and don't wander further than is appropriate. I almost feel bad for them, but I know what they would be if they had their full agency. Monsters, I think. I'd take a chance with any demon over the dark elves. The tray lids come off to reveal a rich spread, making my mouth water at the sight. Thank you, I say out of habit. It smells wonderful. They withdraw as if they know their presence unnerves me, keeping their heads down. But before they manage to make their exit, I stop them with a word. Wait, I say, my voice thin and desperate, but I don't have the luxury to care. Where is Giroth? Out, they say in unison. My gaze drops to the collars at their necks that burn with chaos magic. I can feel it from here, that subtle crackle of darkness. Do you know when he'll be back? The taller one shakes their head. I can't tell if either are male or female due to their unremarkable features, and I remember what Giroth said about them. Neutered. It seems he was speaking the truth. Not that I'd ever doubt him. Please, I say, though I know kindness is unnecessary. Can you take me to him? They glance at one another before the taller one answers. We have been instructed not to open the door for anyone, not until the master returns. I sink against the headboard in disappointment. I can't leave, can I? No, miss, the other says apologetically. The master forbade it. A mirthless laugh finds me. Right, of course. Would you like us to draw you a bath after breakfast? I hate how good it sounds after spending so long despondent in Giroth's care. But I hesitate to say no because I desperately need it. Yes, please. The dark elves bow and make their exit. They're so well practiced at the skill of being invisible, I almost don't notice that they leave at all and turn my attention to the tantalizing spread. Most of it is unfamiliar, but when I taste it, I can't get enough. Just like Giroth, I realize, losing my appetite suddenly, and pick at the strange meat and cooked bronze leaves filled with flavor. Soon, the dark elves return with a robe and towels, guiding me to a heated washroom. The bath is set into the floor obsidian tiles darkening the water as I step in, enjoying the heat seeping into my cold skin. The dark elves coat my limbs with strange-smelling soaps and run their fingers through my wet hair, lathering it up before rinsing it out in the steaming bath. Their touch is oddly soothing, nothing like the dark elves of Pratheca, so I can hardly imagine they're the same creatures at all. They are as dutiful as any servants, and it's almost nice to be doted on by the very beings that had once enslaved me. But it never distracts me from Giroth's yawning absence. The tub is massive, and I wonder what it might be like to bathe with him, to have his claws rake over my flesh, and to feel his powerful form press me against the lip, and... I can't finish the thought, banishing the redness in my cheeks with a palm and sliding under the water's surface, away from the dark elves and their muted curiosity. I refuse to imagine a future we can never have. It is unfair to my aching heart. When I emerge again, the dark elves wait with towels in hand. I can't look at them, even though I know they're not judging my sudden change in mood. Leave me alone, I mumble. I know the way back. With that obedient little bow of theirs, they leave the towels within reach and vacate the room. Alone again, I sigh and rest my cheek against the obsidian tiles, pining after Giroth. By his order, I cannot leave. The thought stings, even though I know he has my best interest at heart. He wouldn't have put such a rule in place if he did not mean to return, right? Even the smallest of doubts grows like a weed in the quiet, until it seeps into every other thought. I stand abruptly and wrap myself with a towel, shaking out my hair in pent-up frustration. I don't know what I expected from him. Nothing has changed since I tried to fling myself off of the island. My sister is lost to me, and the others are slaves to the whim of a king that demands us to be bred like cattle. And Gyrath, He's just a pawn in the game. He doesn't have the authority to compel anyone to do his bidding, and especially not a king of demons. I know how he struggled with me, and the memory brings a bitter smile to my face. It disappears as soon as it forms. What would I even be to him if we could be together in a place like Tilith? A pet? A breeder? My heart sinks at the answer that comes effortlessly. A slave.
Chapter 26 Giroth The king's chaos energy washes over me in his proximity. Whatever your concerns are, Giroth, leave them behind. This is a day to celebrate. You have done a great service to your race. I lower my gaze, focusing on the hem of his sorcerer's robes. Are you not concerned about the missing human? I asked for a dozen, and you returned with nearly twice that. His voice is deep and sonorous. I can't help but be lulled into unwanted tranquility, as if his voice is making me forget something important. My experiments can begin post-haste, and you can return to your kennels at your leisure. If I may, I say, battling the cloy of his assurance. He raises a clawed hand in my direction. Go on. How... I chew on my lip, glancing to where the women have gone. How will you conduct your experiment with the humans? King Asmodeus follows my gaze and offers a shrug. How do you breed your Urgen? Something coils around my gut even as I am compelled to speak. I can feel the press of his focus, even as I cannot see his dark eyes under the hood. The Urgen females are vicious creatures in heat. It is required that they are tethered and muzzled, so that they do not kill the males that wish to breed with them. Some prefer to add vain root to their food, so that they remain asleep during the process. There is silence. I think of Cora in such a situation, her jaw clamped shut and her body strung taut for a host of demons intent on impregnating her, and fury rises inside of me. I can see her glittering, defiant eyes, her spirit never wavering for a moment. How proud I am of her, and how fiercely I crave to protect her from such a fate. I dampen the flames beneath my skin before they seep out, though the king watches me with pointed interest. Does it bother you, Giroth? It is not my place to question my king. That chuckle comes again. No, he agrees, sounding almost disappointed. It is not. With that he adjourns to his throne and takes his seat, sighing as he does so. Do not worry yourself over the missing human. My experiment is just that. An experiment, and there is no doubt we will lose some in the process, which is why I asked for as many as I did. But you don't have to, I think, considering how persistent and sweet Cora was only this morning. We don't need to force ourselves onto these women. They have minds of their own. Even the meekest of them would come around in time. I'm sure of it. And yet how can I argue against the king? He is intent on his plan and there is nothing a lowly kennel master can do to change his mind. Of course, my king. As for the matter of the human residing at your home, he remains thoughtful. Do you intend to breed with her yourself? The question comes as a shock, even as I was expecting it eventually. I scratch where my horn meets my scalp. Well, it's not so easy as all of that. When we coupled, it had taken me by surprise, though I wasn't opposed. I figured it was a one-off for the both of us. Perhaps that is how humans show their affection. If I'd intended to breed with her truly, once would not have been nearly enough to ensure my seed held. If she wanted it, then perhaps. But that is a future I cannot hope to imagine in Tilith. They would expect me to treat her as cattle, and no more. I could not condemn her to such a dismal fate. It did not cross my mind. I have other duties to attend to, such as the hounds and my estate and... Giroth, the king interjects. Do you plan to mate her? I firm my expression, my mouth forming a word that burns as it leaves my lips. No. The king relaxes slightly. It is good to be honest with yourself, he says with a chuckle. If you are not up for the task, there are many who will be eager to take your place. What have I done, I think, doing everything I can to remain neutral? Bring her back here at your earliest convenience. You can take the carriage to hasten your journey. I am eager to meet the human that has given you so much trouble, as of late. The next he speaks. It's more to himself. She tried jumping off the island, did she? I sway on my heels. She did, I answer, though all but my most basic functions have abandoned me. I have promised Cora to King Asmodeus, 
when I could have sought to claim her as my own. I could have protected her. Instead, I'm offering her up to the whims of demons who might very well tear her limb from limb. Tell me, how did she escape the cell block? She didn't, I... I hesitate, my mind reeling even as I press for the answer he demands. She was riling up the other women. I had to separate her from them. We took a walk and she ran away from me. If I hadn't caught her, she'd have fallen to her death. He rests his chin in his hand. Harrowing, he says with dry amusement. At least the other humans are not so rebellious, it seems. I'll make sure to keep her separated from them. Again, Giroth, you have my thanks in this matter. You may go. I bow deeply, unable to say another word if I wanted to. It sickens me to think I have condemned her to a fate worse than death. I know my own kind, and they will see her as little more than a deposit for their foul seed. Her defiance will get her hurt, and I won't be there to protect her. What have I done? I repeat to myself as I storm the halls towards the exit. What have I done? A sizable part of me wants to rush back into the throne room and redact my previous statement. To appeal to the king for ownership of Korra. Ownership, I think with disgust. Is that all I can promise her? They would demand that I put a collar around her neck, sapping her of her fighting spirit. She would become demure and obedient, the exact opposite of why I fell for her in the first place. The thought strikes me in the gut as viciously as any blow. Do I love her? Can I love her the way she deserves? It is too late to think of all that. I have promised her to my king and he will be furious if I disobey now. I had the opportunity to argue my case, and that opportunity has passed. Frisson flares up my spine, and my gaze is trained ahead. The Trovor I pass says nothing, where before they might have looked down their long noses at me in superiority. I am filled with dreaded purpose, and I wonder if they can feel it driving me to madness. I bear my canines at no one and let my fury out on a hot breath. Cora cannot see me like this. I have to get a grip on myself before I become feral and lash out at the next demon to cross my path. The king's orders allow me no leverage to tarry. The carriage is waiting. Chapter 26 Giroth the king's chaos energy washes over me in his proximity. Whatever your concerns are, Giroth, leave them behind. This is a day to celebrate. You have done a great service to your race. I lower my gaze, focusing on the hem of his sorcerer's robes. Are you not concerned about the missing human? I asked for a dozen, and you returned with nearly twice that. His voice is deep and sonorous. I can't help but be lulled into unwanted tranquility as if his voice is making me forget something important. My experiments can begin post-haste, and you can return to your kennels at your leisure. If I may, I say, battling the cloy of his assurance. He raises a clawed hand in my direction. Go on. How... I chew on my lip, glancing to where the women have gone. How will you conduct your experiment with the humans? King Asmodeus follows my gaze and offers a shrug. How do you breed your ergon? Something coils around my gut even as I am compelled to speak. I can feel the press of his focus, even as I cannot see his dark eyes under the hood. The ergon females are vicious creatures in heat. It is required that they are tethered and muzzled so that they do not kill the males that wish to breed with them. Some prefer to add vain root to their food so that they remain asleep during the process. There is silence. I think of Cora in such a situation her jaw clamped shut, and her body strung taut for a host of demons intent on impregnating her, and fury rises inside of me. I can see her glittering, defiant eyes, her spirit never wavering for a moment. How proud I am of her, and how fiercely I crave to protect her from such a fate. I dampen the flames beneath my skin before they seep out, though the king watches me with pointed interest. Does it bother you, Giroth? It is not my place to question my king. 
That chuckle comes again. No, he agrees, sounding almost disappointed. It is not. With that, he adjourns to his throne and takes his seat, sighing as he does so. Do not worry yourself over the missing human. My experiment is just that. An experiment. And there is no doubt we will lose some in the process. Which is why I asked for as many as I did. But you don't have to, I think. Considering how persistent and sweet Cora was only this morning. We don't need to force ourselves onto these women. They have minds of their own. Even the meekest of them would come around in time. I'm sure of it. And yet how can I argue against the king? He is intent on his plan, and there is nothing a lowly kennel master can do to change his mind. Of course, my king. As for the matter of the human residing at your home, he remains thoughtful. Do you intend to breed with her yourself? The question comes as a shock, even as I was expecting it eventually. I scratch where my horn meets my scalp. Well, it's not so easy as all of that. When we coupled, it had taken me by surprise, though I wasn't opposed. I figured it was a one-off for the both of us. Perhaps that is how humans show their affection. If I'd intended to breed with her truly, once would not have been nearly enough to ensure my seed held. If she wanted it, then perhaps. But that is a future I cannot hope to imagine in Tilith. They would expect me to treat her as cattle, and no more. I could not condemn her to such a dismal fate. It did not cross my mind. I have other duties to attend to, such as the hounds and my estate and... Giroth, the king interjects. Do you plan to mate her? I firm my expression, my mouth forming a word that burns as it leaves my lips. No. The king relaxes slightly. It is good to be honest with yourself, he says with a chuckle. If you are not up for the task, there are many who will be eager to take your place. What have I done, I think, doing everything I can to remain neutral? Bring her back here at your earliest convenience. You can take the carriage to hasten your journey. I am eager to meet the human that has given you so much trouble as of late. The next he speaks. It's more to himself. She tried jumping off the island, did she? I sway on my heels. She did, I answer, though all but my most basic functions have abandoned me. I have promised Cora to King Asmodeus when I could have sought to claim her as my own. I could have protected her. Instead, I'm offering her up to the whims of demons who might very well tear her limb from limb. Tell me, how did she escape the cell block? She didn't, I... I hesitate, my mind reeling even as I press for the answer he demands. She was riling up the other women. I had to separate her from them. We took a walk and she ran away from me. If I hadn't caught her, she'd have fallen to her death. He rests his chin in his hand. Harrowing, he says with dry amusement. At least the other humans are not so rebellious, it seems. I'll make sure to keep her separated from them. Again, Giroth, you have my thanks in this matter. You may go. I bow deeply, unable to say another word if I wanted to. It sickens me to think I have condemned her to a fate worse than death. I know my own kind, and they will see her as little more than a deposit for their foul seed. Her defiance will get her hurt, and I won't be there to protect her. What have I done? I repeat to myself as I storm the halls towards the exit. What have I done? A sizable part of me wants to rush back into the throne room and redact my previous statement. To appeal to the king for ownership of Cora. Ownership, I think with disgust. Is that all I can promise her? They would demand that I put a collar around her neck, sapping her of her fighting spirit. She would become demure and obedient, the exact opposite of why I fell for her in the first place. The thought strikes me in the gut as viciously as any blow. Do I love her? Can I love her the way she deserves? It is too late to think of all that. I have promised her to my king and he will be furious if I disobey now. I had the opportunity to argue my case, and that opportunity has passed. Frisson flares up my spine, and my gaze is trained ahead. The Trollvor I pass says nothing, 
where before they might have looked down their long noses at me in superiority. I am filled with dreaded purpose, and I wonder if they can feel it driving me to madness. I bear my canines at no one and let my fury out on a hot breath. Cora cannot see me like this. I have to get a grip on myself before I become feral and lash out at the next demon to cross my path. The king's orders allow me no leverage to tarry. The carriage is waiting. Chapter 27 Cora The bath did little to warm the cold lump in my gut. I dressed slowly in clothes laid out by the dark elves. They're almost my size and neutral in their cut. Not a single moment passes where I don't wonder when Giroth will be back. If he'll be back at all. I press the tunic down over my front and tease its tight fitting sleeves. The high collar cuts sharply over my neck and down, to reveal only the hollow of my clavicle as I stare at myself in the smoky mirror. What will Giroth think? I wonder, unable to banish the hard line of my mouth. Will he even care? My hands pass over the hollow of my sore stomach, and my thoughts drift to our feverish pairing again. I'm not sure why it summons such sudden misery in me. But it sticks with me as I explore the rest of his home, largely uninterrupted. His dark elf slaves certainly know how to make themselves scarce. Still, I expect to find them around every corner. There are some rooms closed off to me, and yet others that are completely empty, as if he simply doesn't have enough stuff to furnish them. Everywhere I go, however, I'm reminded of him. Finally, I find the front door. It is heavy and reinforced, but it couldn't be mistaken. Even though I know better, I wiggle the ornate handle to find it sealed fast. There is no lock or keyhole, but the bite of chaos magic holds it, prickling a warning in my fingertips until I let go. As I try to rub the sensation back into my fingers, something about the door changes. I step back even as it swings open on its hinges, and Giroth stands in the doorway, his face a mask of displeasure. His gaze lands on me with only muted surprise, even as relief courses through me. You're back, finally. He doesn't answer me, and that cold lump in my gut gets heavier. Without a word of greeting, he walks away, taking the tall stairs to the bedroom where we bore ourselves in the warmth of intimacy. Now, he is frigid. I follow. What's wrong, Giroth? No answer. Did I expect one? Yes, I think, reaching for him and stroking his powerful arm. I barely brush his skin before he pulls back, as if my touch burns him. The sudden motion makes me waver. Giroth? He goes about gathering up my scant belongings, wrapping them in a canvas and tying it securely with nimble claws. Still, his lips are drawn in a thin frown, and he refuses to look in my direction. I dare to approach again, craving the security of his embrace even as he's walled off from me. My heart threatens to drag me to the ebony floorboards, and I wonder again if our union meant nothing to him. Please, talk to me. Something ticks in his expression. Out of my way. He storms past me. This isn't... I begin, my mind reeling with the possibilities. Are you mad at me? Did I do something wrong? At that, his shoulders tense. You just don't know when to shut up, do you? His sharp words turn my tongue into lead, and my head goes strangely woozy. This isn't you, Giroth, I say airily. What happened? With that, he pivots on his heel to stare me down with white, hot fury. Enough. You're to be sent back with the other women, and that is final. I will hear no more protests from you, or I'll throw you off the island myself. My blood goes cold in my veins at his fury, but there's something underneath it. Grief. It doesn't suit his hard demeanour, but it thrives on the razor's edge of his voice. Suddenly, I understand everything. He's been ordered to give me back, and he cannot defy his king. Just as I feared he couldn't, I think he expects me to cower from his outburst. To fall to my hands and knees and beg him to let me stay but I will not give him the satisfaction of my grovelling, nor will I spurn his king if it means that Giroth is punished. He has no choice in the matter. I have to know that. Okay, I say easily, taking the parcel from him. When do we leave? He blinks twice. You will not fight me on this. What's the point? I shrug, offering a forgiving smile. It is done. It's his turn to stand, wooden, 
as I get myself ready to leave. I will not shed tears for my fate. I have come to terms with it, and if he will not fight for me, then I have no reason to stay. Even as I maintain a pleasant expression, my heart breaks with a succinct snap so loud, I'm surprised he doesn't hear it. Giroth's gaze is on me, stunned by my easy acceptance. The carriage is waiting. Good, I say. That is good. When my blonde hair is put back and my things are all gathered, I return to his side, even as he watches me like I'm a wild creature again, not knowing what I'll do. I'm ready. His mouth opens as if he means to say something, then his jaw snaps shut again, and he glances towards the door. Come. I bow my head as I follow after him, passing the dark elf servants ever muted. I don't know what Giroth's king said to him to make him so compliant, but at least I'll be there for the other women who are most assuredly frightened by whatever foul machinations they have planned for us. Giroth doesn't need me, they do. And, if he was so gentle, maybe it's not out of the realm of possibility that the other demons might be too. I hope, for all our sakes, that I'm right. He holds the door open for me and lets me out onto the street. This part of Telith is sparse, at the edge of the island. I didn't get much of a chance to explore it when I arrived because I was despondent, wrapped in his arms. I think perhaps that I could fall back into that memory alone and be comforted by him. But reality bears down on me, and his icy disposition is overwhelming. So when he guides me with a hand on my back, I can't help but slip away from him. I think I catch a hurt expression on his face, but he masks it with impatience. You have always been such a lot of trouble, he murmurs, though there's something affectionate that leaks into his tone. It's gone when he speaks again. Get in. I don't grace him with a response, mounting the carriage and sliding in with a singular parcel resting on my lap. He slips in across from me and stares out the veiled window as the wheels begin to turn. From the corner of my eye, I notice that his jaw is working furiously and his brow is knitted together so tightly they're almost a single line. I'd laugh if it weren't such a miserable affair, sapping any joy out of me. I fold my hands over the parcel. Thank you, I murmur. That seems to snap him out of deep thought and he finally looks at me in earnest, that vulnerable expression unbidden. Excuse me? He asks, his tone as sharp as he can manage. Thank you. I repeat a little louder. For everything. I expect him to retort or silence me with another heavy glare. Instead, he simply stares at me, perplexed beyond words. Chapter 28 Kiroth I hate how she sits beside me, so calm and collected. It is an offense to her rebellious nature, and yet here she is, smiling easily at me, thanking me. And for what? What have I done but condemn her to a fate worse than death? How can I explain to her that I am but the extension of my king's will? I have no more agency than a finger to the hand that it is attached to. Perhaps if I'd asked for time to contemplate his question... Maybe I could have fashioned a better excuse to keep Cora a little while longer. But he demanded an answer, and it has tormented me since the moment I uttered it. What can I possibly say to her, who has come to trust me so completely? There's more to the silence than the weight of her acceptance. It's in her hands that are folded tightly over her few belongings. Those hands that don't reach for me any longer to find comfort. How resolved she is. But should I expect any less? It's her resolve that intrigued me and set me to chase her in the first place. Her eyes are clear as she looks through the webbed curtain, and her expression is set to something decided. It does not change when the carriage slows in front of the royal estate and when the door is opened by a Trollvor guard. She hugs the parcel and exits first. I hurry to stand beside her in case the king has decided to haul her away at the entrance. I could not bear our last moment together watching her being dragged away. I could not bear the thought of her glancing back at me with an accusatory stare like others, blaming me for the ruling of my king. And though she seems to need no escort, I keep her in my shadow as we walk through the grand hall that has been opened wide for us. For her. Cora is so small compared to the world around us, 
that I hate myself for taking her from the ground continent. When she ran, I should have let her. With every step, my self-loathing mounts until we reach the throne room. It's a quiet gasp from Cora that makes me focus on the present moment, and I follow her gaze to the throne. It is not King Asmodeus that has stolen her attention, but a woman that sits on the king's lap, scantily clad and smirking at us. Her eyes are the same crystal blue as Cora's, and her long hair is a shade darker than gold. I'm already beginning to expect what is transpiring when Cora verifies it with a hot, tremulous whisper. Laura. Laura issues a teasing wave, then goes back to rubbing the king's chest beneath the heavy plate mail. Hey, sis. Cora starts to tremble. My gaze flits to the king, whose attention is entirely on me. Giroth, he announces, tolerating the woman's groping. I thought you might have gotten lost on the way back. I'm so surprised by the scene in front of us that I've forgotten to bow. I do so in a rush, my gaze never leaving the pair. I would not have been concerned, I lie brazenly. If I had known it was you, my king, that had taken the missing woman. A wry simper comes over Laura, and she glances to the king, stroking what must be his cheek under the darkness of his hood. Again, he seems to tolerate her touch. He could have any matron in Tileth, and yet he has placated himself with a human? This must be some sort of trick that I haven't yet pieced together. This is why I am not suited to court life. Cora moves to approach. I snake an arm around her and hold her fast against me, even as she blurts out. Why, Laura? Laura cocks her head, her hair tumbling over one shoulder, and her gaze sparking with glee. Do you even have to ask? Cora strains against me, and I look to my king. He seems wholly bored by their reunion, and shifts in his seat before speaking, his hand grabbing Cora. I apologize for the confusion, Giroth he says in a rare display of humility. This human acted as my eyes and ears before our siege. I had to be certain it was a viable settlement, and she was only too happy to assist. My jaw tenses as I struggle to keep hold of Cora, whose emotions are starting to overflow. I can feel fury tightening her limbs like an organ ready to pounce. How dare you! She spits at her sister. You did this to us! The king looks to me as if I should control her. He does not know how spirited she is, if he expects reason to settle her rage. Laura, never taking her eyes off Cora, whispers something in the king's ear, and he nods. That smile returns to light up her face, and she slides off his lap and approaches. You don't understand, she says, in a tone meant to reassure. The Dark Elves wanted to work us to death. King Asmodeus has promised us a better life up here will be cherished in Tylith, will be the mothers of a powerful race that can bring about the destruction of the Dark Elves. Cora trembles against me, but there's not an ounce of fear in her. I'd have smelled it on her skin. This is all rage, and I worry that if I release her, she will strangle her sister. What about Beth? And Matt? They could have died during the siege. And you were willing to chance it for another insidious master to worship? The other women weren't given a choice. I, your sister, wasn't given a choice because you took that away from us. A look of disgust comes over Laura's fine features, so like Cora's. I did it, for us. I did it so we could carve out a better future for ourselves, one where we could live for a greater cause than for our corpses to act as the mortar for the Dark Elves' damned cities. The demons are weak without armies. They need us she says with a tone of finality, and we need them. My gaze strays to the king, who shifts on his throne again. There is something keen in the chaos energy building around him, a force that means he is growing impatient with these proceedings. Though I am taken aback by all that has transpired, I have to distract Cora from killing her sister before the king takes it into his own hands, and simultaneously I have to right my grave mistake. Even as she tries to tear away from me to get to Laura, I catch Cora by the nape of her neck and hold her plainly in the king's view. She stiffens under my grip as I growl out my next words. For the price of executing your will, my king, I demand the rights of this human, 
She is mine, and no one else is permitted to touch her under threat of death. It sufficiently distracts all parties from Laura's victorious little rant. The king's attention falls on me again, just as I'd hoped. But I don't give him time to speak when I gather Cora up in my embrace and our lips crash together. At first, she is stunned by the display, but quickly yields to my insistent kiss. I take her lower lip with my teeth, making a show of being more violent than I am, until a keening whimper escapes her. I drag her body flush with mine, digging my claws into her soft flesh. She wriggles against me, gasping for air as our tongues dance feverishly. And I swear in the heat of our caress, I taste her tears in the air. Chapter 29 Cora He wants me. His dark tongue is heavy in my mouth, claiming me with heated fervour. I can't help the tears that spring freely to my eyes as I grin into his kiss. Giroth's pale eyes are closed, and his brow is knit into a scowl, but everything about his heavy caresses tells me he's desperate to prove it to our audience of two. I ignore the surprised gasp from Laura, content to strangle her later. He wants me. Something about his pace changes, and his eyes slide open to revere me. Then, too soon, they flicker up to the king. He holds me against himself as he waits for an answer. The king seems amused, though it's impossible to see his features. You have done well, Giroth, and I accept your terms on one condition. Giroth tenses around me. These humans have been gathered for one purpose. That one is no different. If an attempt is not made to breed with her, then she will be recalled and put to better use. Laura opens her mouth to speak, but the king silences her with a hand. Do you understand? Giroth issues a succinct nod. I understand, my king. My heart races, and I rest my head on his chest, taking in the scent of him. I know I'll be safe with him, no matter what happens. His claws chase down my back before he offers a bow. If that is all. You may take your leave, says the king, standing from his throne. Remember, I expect results. Giroth doesn't say another word, escorting me through the halls with some urgency. It's as if he can't stand another minute in this place. And I don't blame him. I don't know what's going to happen to Laura, but she, more than anyone, deserves what's coming to her. I close my eyes and push the thought down. Giroth? He says nothing as he guides me into the carriage, and is silent until we arrive back at his home. But his gaze remains steady on me, as if he can't afford to look away. Gently. He leads me inside, and as soon as the door shuts, he drops to his knees in front of me, kissing me hard. I can't get a word in, Frison chasing up my arms where his claws graze. He links an arm around me and drags me against him, catching the fabric of my shirt and ripping it off of me in ribbons. I finally manage to tear away. Giroth, wait. No, he says, his hot mouth chasing down my neck and over my shoulder. You heard what the king said. I run my hands through his dark hair. That doesn't mean we can't enjoy it. His gaze meets mine, open and vulnerable. My lips meet his brow. He seems stunned when I pull back and smile at him. I know I'm safe with you, Giroth, whatever may come. Our lips crash again, and this time I don't withdraw. Chapter 30 Giroth I can't count the times we made love. Despite my greatest fears, she survived our vigorous pairing and rests languidly in my arms as morning dawns. As tired as she is, though, she doesn't fall asleep, tracing little circles over the flesh of my chest. I don't think I could rise if I wanted to, after the effort I put into her. It's a strange feeling to be made vulnerable by something so carnal and natural. But everything about Cora makes me vulnerable, and I don't entirely hate it. I take in her scent that lingers with mine. Giroth? she asks, tired blue eyes searching my face. Yes? Her frown deepens. What will happen to the others? The question throws me off guard and I glance away for fear of revealing my own apprehension. 
I recall succinctly the talk King Asmodeus and I had regarding the organ method for breeding, and I'm loath to answer. She continues in a whisper. I just want to know that they'll be taken care of, like you have taken care of me. I don't think it's that simple, I admit. I know, she says in turn, tracing her circles again. I just want to hope that things aren't going to be as bad as I imagine they will be. It's terrible enough that it was my own sister who betrayed us. You know, I saved her when we were young. She was just a toddler, and the Dark Elves had killed our parents in front of us. They were going to kill us too, but their commander ordered for them to take us instead. He said that, for a human, I was tough, and maybe when we grew up, we'd be useful to them. She lets out a little breath before continuing, and I can feel the pain in her voice. I never knew I'd come to regret saving her. This isn't your fault, I assure her. If anything, it's mine. You were just doing as you were told, she says, unable to look me in the eye. And after seeing your king, I get it. He's terrifying. I bite my lip. He's older than the island of Galmaleth. Some say he suspended his life through chaos magic, but there's no proof of that claim. I look down at her again, knowing nothing I can say will change the fate of her friends. I'm sorry for everything that has happened. For everything that will happen. They don't deserve it. She says nothing for a time, and even her hand goes still. It's bad, isn't it? I can only nod. Did you know? Before? Before I accepted the task? I look at her quizzically. Her affirmative is a mouthed yes, and I stroke her back as if to reassure her. As if I could reassure her. I'd never seen a human before that day. I didn't think your kind was any more than standing cattle, to be honest. I didn't know. If I did, maybe I would have gone against my king's command. But someone else would have taken to the task without hesitation. I am glad it was me if it had to be anyone. Because I have you. Her glittering eyes finally meet mine, and she issues a half-hearted smile. I'm glad it was you too. But she's still troubled and I can't blame her. I'm just worried about the others and those we left behind. It's not an easy world down there. No, it isn't, I say, dragging her closer. You are so brave, Cora. No more than the next person that survives Prothica. I can't help but smile. You stand in a cast all your own. When you stood fearlessly to protect those you cared about, I was only just beginning to see the fire inside of you. But you have no equal. Not even close. She accepts my embrace meekly. It's kind of you to say so. I mean it, I say in a growl, or you wouldn't have intrigued me. I can feel her swirling emotions and hope none of them are regretful. Since the moment I laid eyes on her, she has never been far from my thoughts. Her soft lips press against my collarbone. It's not the life I imagined for us, but I want to make the most of it. I want to see the others, she demands. My heart sinks at her declaration. I don't know if the king will allow us to. He has the errant belief that you will rile them up. Her glare is unconvincing. And who gave him that impression? This woman, I think, hating how she sees right through me, though it gladdens me to know that little will slip past her. It will do her well in Tileth. I did before I knew better. Cora's gaze softens. You really think I'm that much trouble? I think you're just the right amount of trouble. I kiss her forehead. And I wouldn't have you any other way. She relaxes against me and sighs. Good to know. I stare at the ceiling as we lie together in the silence. Our concerns linger in the air, never far from us. I can feel hers, threatening to spill out. She wants to protect her friends, and I understand why. If they are anything like her, though, they'll be all right. I have to know that, or I am responsible for their deaths. The king's words echo in my mind. He imagines some will die for the sake of our race, and I wonder if the sacrifice is worth it. Would Cora still care for me if she knew all that I do? Would she hate me? One day, I'll tell her everything, 
I swear it to myself, knowing that whatever alliance we forged will likely be broken beyond repair. I will lose her trust and affection, and she will wall herself off from me. Will she hate the child we create too? I can't imagine she would, even if she despised me. She's as stubborn as an organ and as fearless as a gilak. My little human. Giroth, she murmurs again, sleep dragging at the edges of her constitution. Yes, I ask again, running my claws through her golden hair. What is it, Cora? I want to see them again. I open my mouth to remind her that it's impossible when she puts a finger to my lips. I know you can arrange it. Please? She asks with some emphasis. That's all I ask, for everything I've already given you. She stuns me with her quiet insistence, and I can't help but nod. I'll do my best. Another smile graces her face, this one real and warm. Thank you, she says with a sigh, relaxing against me once more. I look down at her, wondering how she managed to tame such a creature as I. I'd do anything for this woman, even defy my king, and that thought frightens me. But you should be more worried about yourself, I say, passing a hand over her soft stomach. Her fingers lace through mine. I'm not afraid of anything that comes from you, Giroth, she says, as she levers up to kiss me. It is a soft, demure thing that ends too soon. Her eyes meet mine. I think I'm in love with you. Cora's confession melts my hard exterior, and I capture her mouth in earnest, showing her the depth of my affection. When I finally pull away, her lips are that endearing red that I can't get enough of. I love you too, more than you will ever know. She links a leg over my lap and straddles me. Show me. Again? I ask out of an abundance of caution. But aren't you tired? One more time. She whispers in my ear, making it twitch with delight. For good measure. A growl grows in my throat as I flip her onto her back, intent on reveling in her eager acquiescence. How can I say no? Epilogue. Giroth. I jerk up, reaching out toward Cora before my mind even registers what woke me. Her face is buried in her hands, her breathing coming in in sharp gasps, and I realize that she woke up violently, rousing me as well. Cora, I call softly, reaching out for her. I watch the way her spine straightens and she wipes her face clean. I'm sorry for waking you. I shake my head, pulling her toward me despite her resistance. What happened? Her jaw locks. Nothing. My heart sinks a little. She spent her entire life being the positive one, the mother figure, and it's hard for her to share her own fears and pains. She shoulders those alone while she gives others only her positivity. Please, I whisper, let me help you. In a voice so small it nearly shatters me, she whimpers. You can't. I can't stop myself as I gather her in my arms. Tell me what happened, and I might be able to. I'm worried about Matt and Beth, she finally admits as she curls against my chest, always her safe place. I still don't know what happened to them. It hits me then. I can find out. Cora blinks up at me in surprise. How? I can scry. Her blank stare prompts me to continue. We all have some chaos magic. And while I'm not as strong or practiced as the Saz Garoth, I can still do smaller things, like seeing small moments that are coming. She scrambles out of my lap. Please, what does it take for you to do it? I climb out of bed, walking into the adjoining sitting room. Candles. I grab some from ledges and my desk and place them in a circle on the table. An obsidian mirror. I set it in the middle. And chaos magic. My magic leaps from my fingertips, lighting the candles. I sit down before the table and Cora hovers near the end of the couch. Good. I need my distance. I tap the obsidian mirror, drawing up the chaos magic that flows so freely through my veins, and my vision goes black, reflecting its surface. I start to whisper in my native tongue, 
using the words of the God of Whispers, until my intentions start to swirl into reality. I keep my mind blank, except for Matt and Beth's names. It'll be hard since I don't know them, but I hope my connection to Korra will make it possible. As a dark clearing in the woods starts to fill my field of view, I know that it has. My lips are still moving, but I can no longer hear anything as the vision envelops my senses. Before me, though they can't see me, is a group of people huddled together. There's maybe a hundred here, possibly less, but I can pick out the two kids quickly from Cora's descriptions. They look good, healthy, though they are skinny and a little scuffed up. They made it out of the attack alive, and I'm excited to reassure Cora that they are handling themselves well. We have to find them, the little boy shouts, and I'm surprised by the way he commands the attention of the others. They all stare at him, some muttering their agreements. They've taken our sisters, many of our loved ones, and brought the Dark Elves' wraths down on us. We are hiding, starving, and risking our lives daily because of those creatures, the girl shouts. Are they leading a resistance? You all know Kor and Laura. They do anything for those in our settlement, and it's time we do the same for them. I see the disturbance before anyone else seems to. One person is shoving their way from the outer ring to the center, and as people part to let her through, murmurs erupt. The woman stops across the circle from the kids, her face grim and angry. How innocent are your sisters in this? She hisses. The kids blink, though Beth recovers first as she takes a step forward and sneers. What are you trying to say? The woman walks deeper to the center of the circle. I saw Laura the day that we were attacked. She was talking with one of those creatures. Gasps echo through the still air. It thanked her for her help and it didn't steal her away. It offered her a hand that she gladly took. She conspired against us. Shouts start to cut through the air, interrupting the woman. Not Laura! I always suspected her. Girl was looking out for herself. How dare she? She'll pay! So many sentences overlap that it is hard to make out individual words until the woman in the circle shouts, Silence! Surprisingly, the others listen. Before they left, Laura looked hesitant, and the creature reassured her, telling her, Don't worry. We'll be back. The new information ripples through the crowd, stirring up outrage, fear, and shock. I start to lose a grip on the vision as I, too, am surprised. I know that the Demon King is only experimenting with this batch, but for the Sosgaroth to be so certain of our return makes me wonder what more there is I don't know. It sticks hard with the humans, and I hear their screams of fear and fright at the news that the demons will return as I'm pulled away, pushed back into my body. My head throbs with the effort, and it takes a few blinks before I can finally make out my sitting room again, now dark with the candles blown out. I realize that I'm grasping at my skull as I try to contain so many screams and shouts, and I sank back against the couch from exhaustion during the scry. It doesn't do well to be surprised or shocked while scrying as it separates the mind and body, making it dangerous. Cora is crouched before me, clinging to my arm, and she must see the movement of my eyes as I come back into myself because she shifts closer. I lower my arms to look at her, and she searches my face for any clue of what I saw. Apprehension dances in her eyes, most likely from my physical reaction. With a slight tremble in her voice, she gasps out, Tell me everything. Thank you so much for checking out Choosing the Demon. This is the first entry into Pratheka's ever-expanding world of demons and the greater demons of Arkesha Ark. If enjoyed this production, make sure to subscribe down below for free. Every subscribe counts and will allow me to continue releasing these weekly audiobooks. Thanks again. Celeste, now please enjoy this sample of worship. Chapter 1 Charis Darkness is only natural in a place like this. I sit at a corner table in the dimly lit tavern, and as more plumes of smoke rise from nearby tables, I lean my head against the cool wall behind me. I've visited this tavern dozens of times. By now, 
I know every single one of the regulars, and I can guess at each of their conversations. I know the patterns of the people who walk in and out of the place, and I know every one of the barmaids by name. This place isn't anything special, except that it is the easiest place to commit a crime on Arasak. A barmaid comes around, her voluptuous curve swinging. Her movements are graceful, despite the heavy tray in her hand. Would you like another one? I cannot place her accent. It is harsh and low, and her voice is thick and almost hoarse. Not from this part of the planet, I think idly to myself. She could be from anywhere, really. Accents have never been my strong suit. And Arasak is large, sprawling, and unwieldy. New places, people, and accents spring up every day as if organically. As if the planet is a living thing with a mind, a conscience of its own, making fun of us. As if it allows new beings to sprout just for fun. Just to trick us. Just to make us say, Hey, you weren't here a second ago. The barmaid stares at me pointedly and clears her throat. I look distractedly down at my glass. Oh yes, of course. I smile at her, and it is a dazzling smile. She smiles back with uncertainty in her eyes, before she gently takes my glass and whisks it away. She returns within seconds with a glass filled with amber liquid. I suppose she has seen me before. I suppose she knows who I am by now. Knows me enough to know the kind of drink I like. I sip my drink slowly and savor the rich, rasping flavor that slides over my tongue. This tavern, this establishment, might be very out of the way and slightly low class, but they do serve a damn good dram. I lean my head back against the wall again, and I sit and observe. It is early evening, and the sun has crept away from the windows. The only light now comes from the haphazard dancing flames of the torches that are attached to the walls. The building that this tavern is in used to be the fortress of an ancient king who lived on Arasak before even the demons came here. People say that stories of that king are only legends now, but I can see it in the way the ancient volcanic rock is secured together. I can see the proof of that old king's existence in the old but sturdy metal bars that keep the torches secured to the walls. I tilt my head then and listen to the dregs of the conversation that flowed over to me. There is an immense sense of privacy in this place. Maybe it is the constant, thick plumes of smoke that obscure all sight. Maybe it is the sound of the steady splash of alcohol coming from the bar. Maybe it is the low, thrumming thread of music that comes from a music box close by, moving them at dawn, before any of the filth is out. I smile at the words. The people at the table next to me are known smugglers. Their words are tense, and so is their body language. I finish my glass of liquor as I listen to them argue quietly. Clearly, one of their trips around Arasak has gone wrong recently. Not risking it again. Not again. I grow bored quickly by their conversation. It is too simple. Too obvious. I glance over at the flames, flickering dangerously in the torches. They look like they could spill over at any second. Like they could light this ancient place, this place belonging to a king, on fire and raise it to the ground in moments. That is how I feel right now. If something doesn't happen soon, something interesting, something dangerous, I'm going to light this place on fire. I look over at the other tables and try to find a conversation that looks interesting enough for me to eavesdrop. And I see them then, a gaggle of humans surrounded by several dark elves. The human girls are pretty enough, although they aren't to my taste. Would you like another? Another barmaid has come around. She's very different from the last one. She's confident, assertive, and flirtatious. She's a skinny thing, and her collarbones protrude in a way that is very unattractive. She is also human. I shake my head impatiently at her and turn away. I can almost see her pouting disappointedly, but she recovers soon enough and walks away. There'll be someone else tonight who will take her on, who will give her what she wants. Several of the human girls in the group with the Dark Elves have split off into couples. I cannot help but feel annoyed, because the second that the barmaid spoke to me, something in the tavern changed. 
The air is tense all around and I can practically see sparks rippling through it. I listen carefully, trying to catch up on what I missed out on. And I hear one word that makes me turn back to the human dark elf couples. Rulers. The conversations in the tavern are the same as they always are when people speak about the rulers. More and more dark elves are falling for human women. And it is disturbing the status quo. It is making them uncomfortable. The rulers do not like change, and they do not like the shift in power as human women gain legitimacy in dark elf society. There are rumors, things only spoken about in the darkness, about a great long journey if things continue the way they have. Maybe I should have said yes to another drink, I think to myself. I find the whole premise of human women disrupting dark elf society to be ludicrous. I have slept with human women before. I have caused chaos with human women before. They're fun, different, and sometimes quite delightful. But they are just humans. Powerless, weak, and usually very stupid. Most dark elf men aren't looking for intelligent conversation from a woman. All they want is a good, easy lay. I do not see how the rulers could be worried that the humans have any ability to overthrow the current order. My eyes lock onto the human dark elf couple closest to me. He is tall with dark gray skin and long dark hair. She is beautiful, short and well-rounded but lithe. Her bare arms and legs are muscular. She laughs, placing her hand on his arm and caressing his skin. His eyes narrow, looking at her from head to toe with pure desire behind his eyes. Something about that makes my skin crawl. They're nothing but toys for the dark elves. They're pets. A voice comes from somewhere around me, whispering about how humans should be treated in relation to rulers. Indeed, humans are nothing but distractions for us. Some easy entertainment to keep a dark elf's bed warm at night. They're not supposed to be our equals. They're not even supposed to be our long-term partners. They're not worthy of such standing. This whole situation makes my fists clench. I'm tired of hearing this awful conversation about how dark elves and humans are mating. The bar seems a little lackluster, quiet, boring. Mischief crawls through my veins, making my heterochromatic eyes sparkle at the opportunity to have some fun around here. Humans are to blame for this, you know. They're dangerous. They seduce our kin without consequence. Who made them so daring? I agree. Who did such a thing? There should be some ramifications for that. The human women seducing the dark elf men at the corner of the bar should be turned into examples. A reminder to all humans across Erisak of what happens when you overstep your boundaries. Mumbling an incantation under my breath, I focus on a pair of brutish dark elves enjoying their drinks across the tavern. They're dressed in armor so they're ready for a good fight. A ripple courses through the air, slithering through the tavern until it reaches the pair I'm focused on. A coy smirk appears along my lips, sitting back and watching my creation materialize. Within seconds, they burst out of their seats. The sound of chairs scraping rings out in this tavern. One of them immediately reaches for his sword, but the other launches himself across the table with his arms outstretched, aiming for the other's neck. Screams ring out as dark elves and humans alike try to separate the sparring two. However, that's not enough to stop the mess I've created. Another dark elf gets punched. Enraged, he starts to hit back. He hits two dark elves who are not engaged with the situation. A few rapid-fire punches are all it takes to get them fired up. In return, bottles of liquor are smashed against the tables and used as makeshift weapons. Some bottles are smashed over skulls. Pure chaos takes over this tavern. The human women start to get flung into this mess. One of them tries to separate the fighting dark elves. She's cast off to the side like a scrap of trash. Of course, that does nothing to ease the tension within the tavern. I rest easily in my seat, taking another calm sip from my drink as pandemonium takes over the tavern. It's entertainment to me. Violence, chaos, and calamity are just a part of today's show.